Right, good morning everyone and uh, welcome to uh, what is uh, a, the meeting that is being held on Thursday the 8th of August. Uh, we're holding the deputations uh, on the Global Settlement Paper, which is paper uh, number five um, on the agenda for Thursday. And uh, so I'll just run through the apologies and declarations of interest and then we'll move into the deputations. I think there's been uh, some uh, misunderstanding about the process. So this is, these are not submissions. These are deputations on a paper uh, that is being presented to Council. Uh, we made a, a commitment some time ago that the actual debate on the global settlement paper <coughs> would be held in public. Uh, we said that the, uh, that the negotiations, which were commercially sensitive in a number of areas, uh, would not be held in public, uh, but the actual decision-making process would. This is a complete contrast, of course, to the, uh, the cost-sharing agreement itself. But I know that there were some people that commented on the available time for submissions. These are not submissions. These are deputations to be heard on an item that's on the agenda. It's provided for in our, um, in our standing orders and uh, that's what we will be doing today, is hearing the deputations on item number five, uh, which sits on Thursday's agenda. So thank you to those uh, who have attended this morning and will be making those deputations. And just to remind you, uh, th this meeting is live streamed, so uh, there will be both a record for you, but uh, you might want to bear that in mind uh, when you're making your deputation. That's lovely, thank you. So I've uh, called for apologies and there appear to be none. Do I have any early departures or anything? No. Um, declarations of interest, I haven't received any declarations of interest on the deputations. Uh, public participation, uh, the, um, uh, there's no uh, public forum at this meeting and uh, no presentation of petitions, which is item number four and I will now move to deputations by appointment. And uh, we've, we have um, a number of deputations, and the first one uh, is from the Property Council uh, with uh, Roger Davidson and Anthony Goff, if you'd like to come forward. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning, Beth. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning to the Mayor and Councillors. Um, thank you for accommodating us this morning and uh, on behalf of the Property Council we certainly appreciate the opportunity to be able to speak. As noted, I'm Roger Davidson, the South Island President of the Property Council and with me today is my fellow South Island Executive Member, Anthony Goff, suitably attired for a sunny day. Uh, Property Council's goal is the creation and retention of well-designed, functional and sustainable built environments which contribute to New Zealand's overall prosperity. We are a nationally recognised, member-led, not-for-profit organisation offering a collective voice for the commercial property industry. We wish to commend the Council and the Crown on progressing and finalising this global settlement agreement. In principle, we support all the parties working together to achieve outcomes that best support Christchurch to move on with certainty. It is great to see the Council working closely with the Crown and for central government showing its faith in the leadership of our city. We agree that it is time for ownership of many of the central city anchor projects and the residential red zone land to transfer back to the Council. This is a clear indication that Christchurch has moved from recovery into full regeneration mode and we agree with the Crown and Council that it's now a time for normality. The agreement gives everyone certainty moving forward by resolving all the outstanding issues from the 2013 cost sharing agreement. However, this should not mean that all parties become complacent. We need to keep momentum and continue with the outstanding projects such as the multi-use arena and the performing arts precinct. We need to get on and finish what we started and complete the blueprint. Having said this, we're aware of some discussions that continue to question the future running costs of the multi-use arena, which has been influencing some decisions. You may have heard this from me before, 
but the multi-use arena is a key part of the infrastructure of any city for attracting events and visitors and supporting businesses. Christchurch needs to compete on the world stage. If we have a 35,000 seat plus stadium, we will get the events that go to every other large Australasian city and we will become the premium event place for the South Island. Anything smaller would have barely met our needs for the past 30 years, let alone the next. We need to have an appropriate sized arena for our population base that is fit for purpose. It is time to recognise that a multi-use arena is part of the critical infrastructure of any modern city, not a luxury. We need to keep the momentum so this last anchor project has certainty of meeting its completion target of 2023. There are two other areas which we see as key to ensuring there is certainty and momentum. The first being the car park on the performing arts precinct land, not just to support the court theatre, but the soon to be operational convention centre. Secondly, we also see the need to get on and finalise Cathedral Square. Our members surround this area having put their faith and investment into rejuvenating this part of the city. Every day we see the city moving on, although decision, discussions about the cathedral itself have been thwarting our decisions for the square. We suggest council needs to push on and finalise its plan for the square, reflecting the same level of confidence in the area our members have shown. As always, our members have the same goals for our city as council, and we're happy to assist in any way that we can. Again, I wish to thank the Council for giving us the opportunity to speak and note our support with progressing the Global Settlement Agreement and wish to um, acknowledge the work that Brendan Anstis and his team has done about finalising this. Now, Anthony and myself are happy to take any questions that you may have. Thank you very much. Uh, do any of the councillors have questions? Uh, Sarah. Thank you very much. Um, so just. If I was going to summarise, it was like, yes, do this, but give us some more certainty on the other ones as well. Is that right? Uh, yes, because uh, if you look at the other anchor projects like Convention Centre and Metro Sports Facility, we've got certainty. Yep. It's underway. Mm -hmm. We know when the end date's effectively going to be. The two that I mentioned, the multi-use arena and the performing arts precinct, to a lesser extent, we don't. Yep. And, and that's probably our same mantra we've had for the last three to four years. Certainty. Yeah. Once you've got certainty, you create momentum in other areas, whether it be hotels, inner city living, whatever. Yep. But people want that certainty. But no problems with the stuff that we've agreed, just get on with the other bits as well. Exactly. Great. No Thanks. problems with what you've agreed. Yep. Yeah. Any other, any other questions? Sounds as if you've uh, made a clear cut. Um, presentation to us this morning. Ho hopefully the rest of the deputations are of a similar vein, <laughs> <laughs> supporting and getting on with things. Yeah, yeah. I, I think that's the most powerful yeah. point, is that people are looking for certainty. They actually just want us to get on with it, but I think it's timely to be reminded of the need to maintain the momentum. I think that's the key um, to, getting, to getting cracking on those final um, elements that are going to draw the draw the city together. Yeah. A yeah. comment I would make is that um, you've got a business case going on at the moment. I can tell you before you've even got it, it won't make money. Don't expect it to. Just like your sewage system doesn't make you money. It's a critical part of the infrastructure. So please look at it in that way. I know this is an election year and all sorts of political things get in the way, but this is critical to the city. This is our plea. That's lovely. Look, thank you. That's a good note to end on. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you. Um, next we have the Chamber of Commerce, Leanne Watson. Thank you and good morning. Good morning. At the risk of um, repeating many of the messages that we've just heard from Roger and Anthony, uh, I will do that, um, and we haven't <laughs> actually uh, colluded on our deputations, but they're fright, fright, frightingly similar. Um, but I think what that does do is actually reinforce the important components um, of the messages that we're providing. So um, thank you for the opportunity. Over the last decade as a region, we've experienced significant change with extraordinary circumstances, and the governance and oversight of our city have very much reflected that. 
Uh, this wrap-up of the cost share agreement for, um, from 2013 will provide much needed clarity and certainty for businesses and residents. It also provides some strong inroads towards resetting a normalised relationship between the two entities to align with other cities in New Zealand. It is important, of course, for Christchurch and Canterbury to continue to be on the radar for government uh, and have confidence, and for the government to have confidence in our city and its leadership, given we are the second largest city, but as a city of opportunity and not as a city of uh, an earthquake past. The outcome of the agreement is largely positive for the council and residents and will enable the city to increase momentum on our growth trajectory. We're particularly pleased to see that there will be no adverse financial impact to the Council, therefore our ratepayers and that spending has already been uh, budgeted for. While the decision not to transfer ownership of the Christchurch Convention Centre was unexpected on our part, it was a positive outcome for Christchurch residents and for local businesses. We will still be able to access a world-class purpose-built facility which will be future focused and without the potential additional rates burden on maintaining the centre. With the council taking ownership of key assets, we would very much like assurance that the local business community will be genuinely consulted uh, on issues that, that, that may impact them. For example, businesses in the CBD should be consulted on key developments to do with things like Cathedral Square, as these could directly impact planning for businesses in this area. We'd also like to see regular communications on the development progress of all key assets. The business voice should be given stronger weighting than other community interest groups to represent their financial investment in this area. The Council must also recognise the importance of continuing to support businesses who have made the commitment and the investment in the central city through activations, events, marketing and promotion until such time as we complete the delivery of our anchor projects. We'd also like to see the Council maintain momentum on the investment case for the multi-use arena, given the importance of this asset to the central city, and in particular um, on the Greater Christchurch, and I think some very good points made in the early, earlier deputation. It is positive to see that senior officials from both entities will be appointed to monitor and implement this resolution in a timely manner, and strong communication to the public keeping them informed of progress will be particularly important. We look forward to regular updates from this group on progress of the implementation uh, of this agreement. It's also vital that we ma ma maintain momentum to deliver strong outcomes for the city, for our businesses and our community. We commend the Council and the Crown on their collaboration on this agreement and we hope this continues throughout its implementation. Thank you. Happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Uh, I just want to pick up on, on a word that you used, uh, which was the word investment. You know, sometimes people look at things from the perspective of cost, and um, I, I sort of kind of do get that sense from the the, the draft that's in front of us, uh, which talks about you know how much um, the government has spent, uh, and I, I think that it's really important to actually use your language, which is the government and the council. So it's the city and the people of New Zealand have invested in their second largest city um, in order to ensure that we can turn what was a disaster into the opportunity that it can be. Absolutely, and I think it's really important to recognise that the regeneration of our central city in particular has largely been led by private investment. Yes. Uh, and that's why it's essential that we continue to support those businesses who have made those um, decisions based on uh, a blueprint um, mm. and some certainty around uh, what was going to be in the central city and for uh, you know a number of different reasons some of those anchor projects have been delayed so we find our businesses in the central city through no fault of their own having made significant investments um, still struggling with the lack of people uh, in the central city so it, it, essential that we support them. Yeah and I think that that was another point that you made in terms of the uh, you know that, that businesses have ended up leading the way in terms of the CBD, uh, and I mean sometimes I think people do focus on um, you know the, the the CBD, but they don't see that it has this enormous benefit for the city as a whole, right. and actually not just the city but Greater Christchurch. Yeah. I mean the the CBD of Kaipoi is Christchurch. <laughs> Absolutely. You know, it's the Christchurch CBD, so it, it, it belongs really to Greater Christchurch, and that's always been recognised in our urban development framework. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Glenn. Yeah. Thank you. Um, just so on Thursday, Leanne, although cabinet to follow that, but even Thursday alone, um, assuming we agree uh, to this, then that signal alone, can you give us an idea? Um, 
in terms of a step towards certainty, how strong that will be received by the business sector, yeah. both small and large businesses. Yeah, I mean, you've all heard me say several times sitting in this seat the, the importance of creating certainty and clarity for businesses so that they can make good, well-informed decisions. So I can't um, overestimate or underestimate the importance of that. Uh, it's essential that businesses have certainty for the environment that they're operating in. And you know, many businesses are facing uncertainty across a range of different issues. So where we can provide certainty, um, we should. And I think that requires you know, bold leadership from, from all of you around the table to provide that for the businesses operating in Christchurch. Uh, Anne. Morning, Leanne. Morning. Um, you talked about um, the perception, changing perception of, of, of Christchurch as being, if moving from a city that's an earthquake city to one of opportunity. How important do you see this decision, this this agreement, in in terms of providing, of changing that perception? Look, I think there are there are many different opportunities to do that, but this is sending a very very clear signal um, to the rest of New Zealand. And um, frankly, the rest of New Zealand are sick of hearing about Christchurch and its earthquakes. Uh, that's a reality for most people outside of the city. So uh, we need to take every opportunity that we can to change the narrative, to change the story, to provide uh, a new opportunity for people outside of Christchurch to see actually what an exciting city it is. And we know that people, um, you know, if you, there's been a lot of surveys done um, you know, over the last few years, and often when we survey people in Christchurch, so people that have been here for a long time, um, their perceptions of the city versus those that are actually coming in, new, fresh into the city are very, very different. So we've got to make sure um, that we're telling the right story. This is a we've got a fantastic opportunity, like no other city in New Zealand, and in fact, often no other city in the world. Uh, and we need to take advantage of that. So every opportunity that we've got to reinforce the forward momentum is really uh, essential. And we we cannot continue to. Um, bicker and, and talk about all the things that are wrong. And yes, there are challenges ahead of us, and I, I totally accept that and understand that, but we've got to front foot that and we've got to show good, positive leadership for the city moving forward. Yanni? Thank you for your presentation. I was just trying to get a sense of, um, in terms of priorities, where you, where you would see things like fixing uh, horizontal infrastructure versus the anchor projects particularly around things like our water you know, network, which yep. obviously we're fluorinating at the moment. So just want to get some sense of um, how important or you know, where you see the priorities in terms of council spending going forward. So I very much see both of those examples that you've just given as an and, not an or. Um, we cannot have a city that doesn't provide you know, good quality drinking water. Uh, we cannot have a city that has broken pipes and broken roads. We have to make sure that the amenities of Christchurch are fit for the second largest city in New Zealand. There's absolutely no doubt about that. But at the same time, we need to make sure that we provide the right sort of amenities and facilities for the people of uh, Christchurch and Greater Christchurch and the South Island to contribute back to the economic vitality of this city. Uh, that's essential. If we don't provide those, we don't attract people, we don't retain people, and we certainly will not attract and retain businesses in this city. So that, that, that there's not a, a one over another. We need to do both of those things, and I appreciate that that's challenging, but we've got to find ways of doing that. And if that means exploring different funding channels, different procurement methods, we should be bold enough to actually have those conversations. Okay, thank you. Um, and just the second question I had was around, um, obviously seeing what's happening, you've talked about some businesses struggling, and certainly in the central city you can see even new businesses in, Ho in the new Hoyts building um, seem to be turning over quite quickly. Yep. Just, um, do you think at a high level there's any land use planning structural issues that we need to address as a city that we're not currently addressing that might help the central city? Um, look, I think um, without getting too specific, because I'm looking at the clock and I'm 17 seconds away, uh, I think what we need to do is make sure that um, everyone involved in supporting businesses in the city uh, acts as an enabler and not a barrier. So we've got to find ways to actually enable people to do the things that they need to do. Um, you know, there are businesses that are performing really well in the city, and there are pockets of um, industry and businesses that are really struggling. So we've got to make sure we wrap support around them in whatever capacity that requires. And if that's providing more activations to get people into the central city, if it's looking at how we communicate the right um, routes to get into the central city and the right parking options and all of those sorts of things, we've got to do all of those sorts of things rather than actually one thing in particular. I don't think there is one magic silver bullet to actually fix this. It's a matter of looking at all of those opportunities to enable businesses to do the best that they can do. 
Okay, well that's um, time up. So Great. look, thank you very much for your submission. Much very appreciated. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next one is the Otakaro Regeneration uh, Company. Uh, Rob Kerr of Kerr and Partners. Good morning. Welcome. Good morning. Kia ora koutou, everyone. Thank you very much uh, for, for having me and thanks for the opportunity. Um, first of all, uh, well done Brendan, team, everybody, for getting to this uh, milestone. I, I'd like to endorse what Leanne and, 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 and Roger and others have just been saying around um, this is an important um, place to get to, uh, but of course it's not, the, it's not the end point, it's a starting point as well. So, um, so well done guys and it's, uh, and it's great to be here. Um, so as you're aware, my background includes um, working with the Waimak District Council leading the physical recovery out there, uh, working with Sierra and Otakaro leading a number of the anchor projects, uh, as well as more recently uh, leading the development of the regeneration plan for the Otakaro Aden River Corridor. Um, I don't do that anymore, uh, which is uh, maybe good for some people and it's definitely good for me. But um, <laughs> my role now is, is, is somewhat different, but I maintain a, a strong interest in the residential red zone. Uh, so I'm now director of the Otakaro Development and Management Company, um, and we're working with a range of project directors, project developers, sorry, project developers, <coughs> investors, financiers, and potential operators to put together a proposal for you uh, that is, I think, very exciting and very ambitious, and will cross, uh, will bring together a whole range of projects that are, well, they are the preferred land uses that are aligned with the regeneration plan that we drafted. Um, we're currently looking at 24 different projects uh, across a broad range of um, project types, uh, which we think that uh, will bring massive benefit to the city and take a significant step towards realising the vision of the plan. We won't be looking for council funding, and we're in a position to fund and deliver those projects ourselves or with our partners. Uh, and we can do that at a reasonably quick rate. In fact, we prefer to do it at a reasonably quick rate uh, because uh, then the benefits come as a whole portfolio rather than in a piecemeal approach. They're all commercially based, able to realise public benefit and reflect the desires, desires and aspirations that has been expressed through the, the many years of consultation uh, around the, the future use of the residential red zone. So importantly, they're able to pay a ground lease to the council as landowner should you uh, adopt this agreement. Um, which brings me to the single submission point or deputation point that I want to make. Um, I could talk about all the other bits and pieces in the global settlement, um, but I just want to focus on this one thing and it relates to clause 28.1c of the sale and purchase agreement for the residential red zone. Uh, because I believe this clause as it currently stands uh, will have a significant long-term impact um, on the ability for the city to realise the vision of the regeneration plan and, and the potential that is in the, in the RRZ. This clause says that any revenue generated from the residential red zone must be shared 50-50 with the Crown. Uh, this is despite the council that the council will be taking on all the maintenance liabilities associated with all the land. Now, my particular point is in relation to the Yotaka Raven River Corridor, but this clause applies, I think, to all the residential red zone land. It's also similar, if not the same wording, as has been used with Waimak District Council on the settlement that they, or the agreement that they reached with the with the council, um, with the Crown, some time ago. So when we work through the regeneration plan, we're very much aware, um, and a key philosophy behind it is to find ways to make it self-financing. We look very closely at whether, from a capital point of view, it would be able to help fund uh, the public side of the projects. In reality, the land is worth very little, and it is very difficult to make any actual development or capital cost out of it. But the key challenge, I think, that as a city and as a, as a council and as ratepayers that we'll have is the significant maintenance liability that comes wa with this land. So you may be buying it for a dollar, but that is not the cost of, what, of ownership that you should be thinking about. So um, the analysis, analysis that we've done, that I've done, uh, shows, however, that um, with the right balance of commercially based and public sector, public uh, projects, but free access projects, uh, you can drive enough rental income to fund the maintenance 
of the of the, the balance area. And I think that's really important because the numbers are reasonably large and it will be forever. It will be a, a cost in perpetuity that the rate payer will have to bear. So if 50% of the revenue, however, goes to the Crown, uh, you have no chance of being able to secure enough rental income to be able to uh, make this area self-financing uh, from a maintenance and operations perspective. Uh, so I would recommend, obviously, from where I'm coming from, that the, the Council rejects this clause or seeks to amend it so that it is, an, it is a net revenue, because it is a profit share, right? So it's a net, pro so, the, so the share of the 50-50 share of the profit is after maintenance and, 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 and management costs. This is why this is a very significant financial decision for the Council, because the $1 price tag produces um, a, a multi-million dollar bill every year for maintenance. And I would suggest that's unnecessary. Uh, it obviously has the financial benefit in terms of Council's accounts, but it also will have the impact of impeding or preventing uh, particularly community-based projects from um, from progressing in the area because the the problem of maintenance and who pays for it will always be an impediment to any of those sorts of projects. But if you're able to wrap a, um, a structure around it where there is a self-financing part to it, so those sort of projects that everybody wants but cannot afford because of the long-term maintenance are able to be funded. So I think you have the opportunity to set this up to deliver the vision at minimum cost to the ratepayer, but it, enable it to happen. And I really um, support the comments that Leanne was making, is that you, know, you need to think in the different ways to be able to achieve this. Otherwise, otherwise you will be only, everybody will only be thinking of this as a park and be putting their hand out to the council for funding of park-like facilities. And there are such significant costs associated with that. So I'd suggest you want to look very closely at clause 28.1c of the, of the sale and purchase agreement and really consider whether there's some alternative ways to do that. Um, as always, I'm happy to assist you and, 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 and council staff in understanding that further um, and happy to answer any questions. Well, I thought, given your background, I was going to ask you a very direct question on this particular <laughs> subject, which was in the um, Waimakariri uh, district's agreement with the Crown uh, in relation to the settlement of their, of their residential red zone component, was this provision included in it? And if so, have they in, at any time leased or sold any element of the land? So as I understand it from my memory, um, is that this applies to the agreement, but in practice it only applies to the mixed use business area just on the north side of the, uh, of the bridge over the Kaipoi River. Uh, it still applies, however, development of that area in reality is some years off. Um, and when it happens, that 50-50 cost share will, or profit share will apply. I don't believe it, it either doesn't apply or it doesn't practically apply to the balance of the area because there's no or very little commercial outcomes there. It, it always seemed to me that there was potential for the for the lease value. I mean, we're not talking about selling the land. We're, we, yep. It's the lease um, leasehold. When we're talking flat zone, I mean, there there is potential for re re um, zoning land in the Port Hills. So, and I think that's a separate issue. But if you look at the um, the flat land, uh, it seems to me that there is potential for uh, the the lease to be reinvested in the in the red zone for areas that are going to be um, park like. I mean, the the, this, the the green spine is going to be this incredible pathway from the city to the sea. You'd you'd actually kind of expect that there is. A, a kind of a reinvestment mechanism, not a return to the Crown, certainly not under the circumstances that the land was taken from those um, in the residential red zone. I can speak as from personal experience, um, but, but from that experience, uh, people were not given a genuine option of um, the Crown's offer. It was take it or leave it, and there was nothing in between. Yes, yeah, so I think a plain read of the agreement as it stands 
uh, would suggest that if the council leases the land, then 50% of that revenue goes to the Crown, not reinvested in the area. Okay. You may find a way to structure the arrangements differently that that doesn't happen, but that's a plain read of the agreement as it yeah. stands from me. Okay. Um, I've got Tim and then Sarah. Yeah, thanks, Rob. Um, just two quick things. One with regards to the clause. When you, you rent something or lease something getting a profit, whether it's gross net or otherwise, one would usually take the costs of maintenance prior to the finished net or gross profit, if there were any. So That's correct. That's not what it says, but that's... Um, no, but we're not there yet, so... Yeah, 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 yeah. that's right. OK. And the other, the other thing you raised with regards to people looking at a great green, like a park, um, quite right to a degree, but we do have those, um, like the um, AMP showgrounds in Nipunawai, where we've got that middle ground, if you like, commercial plus recreation, so it's not like a Hagley Park, etc., with the Port Hills. Yeah, so we, absolutely. Yeah. Hi, thanks, Rob. Your concern seems to be around the viability of the actual um, the potential businesses or operate, you know, operators of spaces within the land. Is that right? I, I mean, are you concerned that 50% of their profits and their revenue would go to the Crown? Because it's no. only the, co the council stuff, so anything that you did there, if you were able to use that land, would not be impacted. It would just be No, that, I think this is an issue for council, not an issue yeah. for developers or, or, yeah. or project so operators. So it stop uh, operators. So it would pay, it would pay a, a market um, ground lease, or whatever's agreed. Whatever's agreed, But then, yeah. on, under the agreement, council would need to hand 50% of that over to the Crown. Yeah. Whatever. So that would, re that would halve the council's revenue. Yes, then yes. it's fine. Okay, look, thank you very much thank and uh, really appreciate your submission this morning. Well, deputation this morning, not a submission. Thank pleasure you. every time. Um, uh, Revolution, uh, Hayley uh, Guglietta. Hi. Hello. Welcome. Thank you. Hi. Hi. I'm Hi. Hayley and this is Emma and we're representing the Revolution Collective. Um, I'm just going to put this up so you can walk, look at it while I'm, uh, how do I play that? Uh, oh, it's playing itself. It'll play while I'm talking. Um, so, sorry. So uh, we're here representing the Revolution Collective, which is people with interests along the Richmond part of the River Corridor. Um, so getting a perfect outcome with this settlement was never going to be easy. Um, and from our community's point of view, we feel very much heard and commend the team involved in putting the global settlement together. Um, we ask you as our councillors to sign this off without haste and in order for our communities to get cracking and get this done. It has been nine years and we feel we need certainty. Um, we are at the risk of losing the harnessed energy that we've got, and we're also at risk of losing some really cool projects in the river corridor um, that may not get off the ground if we don't keep moving forward. Um, I'd just like to briefly introduce you to the Revolution Collective. It's a group of organisations stretching the length of the river corridor adjacent to the suburb of Richmond, some of whom you'll probably hear from today, no doubt. Um, we currently have over 20 stakeholders uh, in our collective, representing current transitional uses, proposal proponents, river corridor supporters and other Richmond organisations. Our vision is to collectively realise the Red Zone Futures Plan for our part of the river in a community-led way for the betterment and revitalisation of our wonderful suburb. The combined collective will bring economic benefits, cost savings, mass plantings, a sense of well-being, and a damn good place to visit, not only for our surrounding community, but for the greater Christchurch and beyond. So I'm just going to hand you over to Emma, who's going to... Um, this is proof that the community activation is already working well uh, to deliver what the local community wants to see and to be involved at a low cost to the council. We know from numerous research projects that there are huge benefits for community in terms of benefits to mental health, 
reduced issues like addiction and increased social cohesion if there are nature-rich spaces to gather, relax, and play in. <clears throat> Many still feel a strong sense of loss for their homes and neighborhoods, and having nature-rich spaces, a local and wider community can develop a sense of stewardship, a level of control and engagement, and will hopefully help to alleviate some of that's been lost. We've already seen this, what's happening in Revolution. Local community are highly engaged. Families come together. Children are using the space for play and connection. Celebrations and gatherings are well attended. Surrounding groups like the Children for Banks Ave are keen to create spaces to play and for families to come together. The sense of engagement <coughs> and empowerment that the children have gained from this project is really inspiring to see. Uh, we know that two of the main elements for building resiliency in children and communities are a connection to people and a connection to place. Yep. Um, and we also know that worldwide, for a whole raft of reasons, we are facing issues as a result for children's ability to freely and safely play in their local area. The opportunity for the next generation of children in the East to reverse this is exciting. This could be happening all along the red zone with neighborhoods having new places to connect and engage with each other and with the land. Signing off, uh, off this global settlement is int integral to the realization of revolution. We need to capture the current level of energy and enthusiasm by enabling more fluidity around transitional uses structure in order for some proposals to get off the ground and existing proposals to fly. The lease agreements need to be less restrictive and the process of applying more transparent. So recently, um, oh, I'm not very good at this. <laughs> There, recently, <laughs> environmental great Jane Goodall came and took a whole morning off her busy schedule to spend time at the Revolution Proposals. Now, if this is not proof that a community-led project can in fact attract the lens of an international hero, then I really don't know what else we can do. <laughs> <laughs> so this is a time to change the narrative. We need to change it from disaster to exemplar, so we ask you to get this done, we get it done quickly. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. It's, it's, you know, it was a very powerful presentation, thank you. And I'm, you know, I was really pleased to hear the, the focus on uh, social connection and social cohesion. I think it really you can't find a, a more important use for, uh, you know, what was people's um, homes and neighbourhoods and, and actually allowing it to, to bring um, neighbourhoods together um, actually reflects the purpose that always existed uh, in those places. So, no, it was really powerful. Thank you, uh, Dion. Yeah, just on the, um, the the agreement around the transitional uses and things like that, um, we've obviously got some change potentially happening with the transitional use. Do you think that will be easier to get things done from your perspective of somebody that's getting things done in this area? We're hoping so. So we're obviously in a great position where we, we've got our, our, our lease in place and we're getting things done. But the likes of the work that Emma is doing, that, I don't want to answer that because you're in that position. Um, yeah. Just the um, the kind of the restrictiveness of, of the um, the length of lease and when you know the um, the end of clause uh, is, is is sort of restricted if you're bringing in materials and then you know that you've only got a short time before you've got to remove everything again. And is that restricting um, getting investment to make these things happen as well? Yeah, investment and also just that, um, you know, everybody's got limited amount of time and energy for, for projects. Um, and if there's some security in the, in the long term, um, yeah, easier. We'd certainly find Revolution, for example, there's lots of proposals within that collective that are sitting waiting because of the time it takes and the restrictions on the leases to get things moving. Yeah. Um, Yanni? Yeah, um, thank you. Thank you for the work that you're doing. I've you know, seen it firsthand. I, I don't know if you've had a chance to kind of look at the whole budget for the red zone and how that money will be spent and whether you would want any sort of um, engagement, consultation around, around that. Absolutely, and um, so our thoughts are that if we are enabled to get our projects on the, off the ground, then long term it would then reduce the costs for the council because those maintenance costs would then get in, absorbed into what we're doing and hopefully we find ways of being 
more self-sufficient. Yeah. So certainly, yes. Yeah. And we would also like to see that where that be engaged in that process of where the money gets spent because it does it makes more sense to spend it where there's activation um, to get some infrastructure done where, where there's actual activation in the first place rather than somewhere where there's not nothing happening. Right. So maybe I mean a clause is part of this that would enable us to consult on the three hundred million or some of that money that's tagged within the three hundred million around the red zone might be helpful. That's certainly the outcome that the community would want is consultation on that process, yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Yep. Um, uh, Pauline. Thanks. Just a sorry if this is obvious and I've missed it, but are you, are you an incorporated society in the charitable state? No, we're operating as a collective, so which shows the level of enthusiasm amongst the people that are working on this. Yes. Yep. And it's most likely that it will stay that way for now. Yeah. Because each proposal sits in its own capacity. Mm. So. Can a collective get um, charitable status? In other words, I'm thinking of if um, you could be able to fundraise for assistance outside of council. Um, the, each proposal is looking at that anyway. Yeah. So um, this is the, our point: is that we, as, a, as individuals and a wider group, are taking away some of those costs from the council. Mm. Yeah. Cool. By what we're doing. Yeah. Okay. Are there any barriers to transitional use that you would want us to look at in terms of the global settlement? Absolutely, yes. <laughs> yep, one of the biggest. That was not planned. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, absolutely, the um, length of the lease. Yep. The uh, the uh, thirty day clause, which has, has been extended, but still for some outside funders, again reducing the council's input in finding outside solutions. Um, having a, a longer term, long term out clause to enable us to get funding from private funders and other sources. Yes, what, absolutely. What's the 30 day clause gone to? 180, I think, six months. Yeah. Six but still, months. for some funders, that's too much of a risk. Yeah, so yeah. I don't actually understand it myself. It doesn't make sense. It doesn't because make sense to us either. It seems to me <laughs> that the original 30 day clause was, was modelled on what was happening in the CBD. But the CBD model was specifically designed for you know the gap filler type arrangement, where uh, where a, 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 a you know gap filler would go in there knowing that they've got 30 days to shift if they need to because um, you know business development might be going ahead you know so it made sense in the CBD it makes no sense in the residential red zone so absolutely we will continue to raise this um, but it might be quite good if we could find a resolution through this process yeah yeah because yeah. there's, there's some good projects that really could fly right now I know I know if that was and, and the thing is is that I don't think that we should be fry I mean this is this is an intergenerational project the red zone this is not something that's going to happen overnight and it's not going to happen in the next 10 years either um, and you know there is potential for transitional projects to morph into the permanent use Absolutely. and um, and I think that we should not let that opportunity um, get lost in a whole lot of detail about um, who's making what decision when and how so um, that, that will be at forefront of mind I think on Thursday when we come to make a decision. Awesome. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Cool. Right, um, Richmond Community Gardens, Kathy Alden. Kia ora, good morning. Kia ora, good morning, good morning, Mayor, good morning, councillors. Uh, this is Rachel Crawford, my fellow resident in Richmond, and Julie Crook, she's also resident in Richmond Community Garden in Richmond. Uh, so thank you for the opportunity for us to come and speak today. Um, I'm speaking on behalf of the Richmond Community Garden's transitional project in the Richmond Red Zone. I just want to acknowledge the process and the work so far um, from the government and regeneration, um, regenerate and also the community and that this is a positive um, pathway going forward basically so really excited that this is happening now and um, so I just uh, want to go back to the Richmond Community Garden we're a transitional project um, since 2017 but we actually formed back in 2014 um, from Avebury House and 
back then it was a pretty sad and lonely place. Um, we'd lost our communities, we'd lost our, some of our amenities, we'd lost the people. And um, it was an op opportunity waiting to be reborn. And I go back to when I came here and did a submission back in 2015 for the Avebury Paddling Pool to be reopened. And I remember, Leanne, you said to me that working in partnership with the community is the way forward. And um, from that, it was true. Um, you know, there was a feeling of community and reconnectedness and well-being and that sense of belonging in Richmond and the ownership and the empowerment <coughs> that came with that working in partnership with council um, really cap catapulted us forward um, <coughs> and we created a bit of a groundswell down at Avebury um, to then further develop and engage uh, the Richmond Community Gardens into two acres and um, we took on a two acre lease with Linz and in just two years we've developed that site with um, with the volunteers and uh, the community and with funding through the community boards and um, we've developed obviously um, a vegetable garden um, we've got various projects on site from um, create uh, building up the native garden uh, workshops uh, development of our little produce shop um, which so we can become more self-sustaining that's the idea we want to self-sustain we don't want to keep asking putting in funding applications and obviously putting in funding applications when you've got a limited lease is always going to create problems um, so really going forward working with council um, would be the way I think um, so um, we've attracted much in com community engagement we're really well supported by local residents it um, brings a lot of uh, happiness to the people that work with us and from the community and at times we just can't keep up with the pace you know things are just it's snowballing and you know we're always at capacity and we always want to do more it's just that we're limited limited with funding um, yeah um, but our volunteers have quadrupled and we went from five <coughs> volunteers to 10 to 12 um, 20 upwards we've got lots of outside groups wanting to engage with us schools uh, and we're also making friends with all the other organisations as well around, so Avon Forest Park, Avon Attacker Network, Greening the Rubble, um, Nature Play, the um, local school, Cassidy Bambini. Um, so there's all these other threads coming together, and we can just you can just feel the momentum and the capacity building. Um, so I do think going forward with you know talks and structure around funding could really um, you know, enhance this opportunity. Sorry, um, I haven't read through the whole document. I don't know the details, but we're a small piece of the puzzle and I'm just very passionate about what we're doing. And um, there's other people, obviously I work in a team of people. Um, so I'm just sort of more at a grassroots level with the volunteers, but it's a great feeling. We enjoy what we're doing. Yes, we do. And, you know, I think I said back uh, f three or four <coughs> years ago when we, when we did the Avery Paddling Pool, you can really see that Avery and the Richmond Gardens can become a destination in its own right. And I really do support the revolution concept. Um, I think uh, it could be a real grassroots, um, community-led um, destination. As people would go to Hagley Park on a Sunday afternoon or Victoria Park, people will think, and they already do think, they come to our site and you can easily spend three or four hours, particularly in summer when the paddling pool's open, and there's a real buzz. So I'd like to think that people will go, oh, what should we do today? Oh, let's go for a bike ride, let's go for a coffee, walk around the gardens, play in the paddling pool, go and do a, a, a river loop. So really, in terms of investment and people and community, if you really focus your energies um, there, it can only ripple outwards, which is what it's already doing. So rather than starting to closer to the city or further, hopefully more of a central point, we'll just sort of start mm. rippling out. Um, so going forward, we really look forward to continuing our partnership with the council and to further activate and regenerate this section of the river corridor. Um, I don't know whether anyone else wants to say anything. Uh, do you want to say oh, anything oh, I'm support? a local resident and I've seen the garden grow from nothing into now and also a free house. And I'm a big supporter. I'm a cheerleader of the area. I've got two young children and 
I love seeing it come alive and the energy. I, I tell everyone about it. I'm a bit of a recruiter for the garden. <laughs> yes. But uh, it's great. You, you tell people this is happening, and I think it's so exciting to be able to, like Haley said, harness the energy of what's going on and allow a long-term growth, you know, as it wants to grow, to grow, and as us all um, changes over ownership and things, that keep in mind to keep this area and allow it to grow um, while the passionate people are here wanting to do it right now. Um, and then it, it's bringing in even more people in the community. And the Matariki night we had the second year, it was amazing. Mm -hmm. uh, just just beautiful. Out under the stars, you know, Hangi, all the community and people from even outside the community being able to come together and for hours, you know, and to be together. <clears throat> so it's it's been amazing. So, yeah. Any questions? Thank you. I could uh, go on. <laughs> just, just to be, um, just to, I think the one point, oh, thank you very much for all of what you are doing. It is really cool to see over the last three years, especially so much, um, you know, change in, in the way people are engaging in that, that space. And the residential red zone, which is part of this agreement, has, has been a catalyst for that. But the one thing I want to touch on, so the thing I think you're asking for here is the certainty around the use of the land. Absolutely. And that agreement that you need to have with whoever holds the ownership or the, 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 you know, the governance of that to have certainty around the use of that more longer term than what you've got. That would be correct, yeah. Okay, cool. Thank you. Yes, I'm, well, uh, uh, the councillors have heard me say this before about many areas, but I used to live in Richmond, and um, it, it was... <laughs> I think you're going to hear about Richmond a lot this morning. <laughs> yeah, I know. I, yeah, I've been everywhere, man. Um, so... <laughs> but it, it's a really special community, and um, you know, the, and I, I think people sometimes forget that that although there is sadness associated with uh, the way that um, the residential red zone was created, its transformation into this wonderful Otakaro Avon River corridor ha um, has the ability to um, restore and heal communities. You know, um, I think you've really spoken to that in terms of what the community gardens have generated and your comments about Matariki bringing community together uh, into that wonderful space that has been created. It's a public space. Yeah. Um, and uh, I, I just, yeah, so I mean, I just wanted to kind of repeat what, what Dion said, which was to thank you for what you're doing. Mm -hmm. It matters and it does create meaning for those of us that lived in these places and it's, mm -hmm. it's wonderful. All right. Well, look, thank you very much for your presentation. Thank Much you appreciated. Thank yeah. um, The o Avon Otakaro Network, Evan Smith and Kyle Sutherland. Uh, people have had a, a deputation um, presentation circulated. Yes? You should have that on your desk. Uh, uh, kia ora koutou. Um, uh, Eben and Kyle, on behalf of Avon Otakura Network, uh, thank you very much for this opportunity to comment on the proposed Global Settlement Agreement. Um, firstly, we would like, like the others, uh, to congratulate Council and Brendan and his negotiating team on a good sound proposal, considering the complex circumstances. We believe it um, provides a clarity on the way forward. It's an enabling approach and you've seen the passion and commitment and energy from the communities surrounding the red zone. We want to get on with stuff. We want to be enabled to do stuff. Um, and this is a good step forward in enabling that to happen. And to quote the proposal itself, we think the, the agreement does provide a solid foundation for locally led regeneration. We endorse the proposed outcomes with their focus on people, momentum, value, and future. The focus on momentum is particularly important to us in Avon Atakura Network because currently regeneration momentum has come to a grinding halt in the corridor. There are still significant bureaucratic and funding roadblocks and barriers to any progress with trans transitional use, let alone any long-term use. The global settlement begins to provide pathways to clear these, and that's extremely important but they need to be actioned, and they need to be actioned with some urgency or significant opportunities will be lost. We also currently endorse, strongly endorse 
the proposed transitional planning for governance of the residential red zone, including the corridor. In particular, the phased approach, the approach to support, strengthen, improve and enable red zone regeneration, the immediate steps, uh, next steps that have been identified, and particularly the community co-governance model that's been identified with a significant role for Naitahu and Mana Whenua. We have advocated for such an approach and wish to thank you for hearing us, but the proof as always is in the pudding. We would caution that the approach must support and not compromise the corridor regeneration plan, mm. which communities have invested so much time and effort into. It must not be an, an opportunity to relitigate this. Mm. It needs to ensure all future uses also align with a framework of clearly defined guiding principles and strategies on resilience to natural hazards, on indigenous biodiversity, on cultural narratives and aspirations, and on community engagement. Engagement with neighbouring local communities, with former residents, and with the wider metropolitan um, residents. It should include communities and stakeholders and decisions about what to prioritise in terms of land parcel conveyancing in the corridor by reviewing current proposal pipelines, and there are substantial pipelines. In com include communities and stakeholders in what transitional and long-term governance could look like. That discussion is yet to be really had in the public arena. Recognise the unique nature of the different red zone areas in the governance structures. One size does not fit all. They're very different areas in very different situations. Make local representation within the governance ward-based rather than community board-based for more equitable re representation geographically but also add representation of the metropolitan view. It's not all about the local residents. There is a need for urgency to ensure more opportunities are not lost before greater momentum can be unlocked. We need interim action before December 2019 when the working party is meant to report back. We cannot wait another six months for progress to be made. We're already losing good opportunities and good people also, we note um, the reference to environmental health in a document. It needs to be explicit that this means ecological health. There is a difference between the two. We need to make provision for a one-stop shop, fast-track application processes process for funding within the residential um, red zones for transitional use, which includes an integration of council, crown in terms of DIA and DOC, and philanthropic administered funding streams. Look at new ways of doing this stuff, an example of testing new and innovative ideas while expediting regeneration momentum. We endorse the Red Zone Agreement, in particular the transfer of Red Zone lands for $1, and we note there the exception of uh, the lands in the Port Hills, um, and the transfer at essentially nil cost, as that will uh, assist greatly in the viability of these regeneration projects. And the early settlement date of 1st of July 2020 for all red zone lands except obviously Port Hills. However, we would caution that although we support the transfer of corridor red zone as multiple titles, we advocate strongly for retention of all such titles in single public own ownership in perpetuity to retain the integrity of the corridor, whether that ownership remains with council or is subsequently transferred to some form of public land trust. It is our strong view that any component land uses, including residential housing or commercial uses, should be only on a leasehold basis. We are concerned that the current settlement does not prevent the corridor lands being subdivided and components stripped off for sale by the future public owner as a revenue generating exercise. With regard to this, we do note that any net proceeds from sale or lease post settlement will be split 50-50 between the Crown and the Council. It is unclear to us whether this is in perpetuity. The feasibility and viability of projects could be significantly impacted if the Crown demands a 50% commercial or a market rate return, particularly where there are important non-economic benefits to consider. We also note that not all land council lands in the corridor will necessarily be included in reconfigurated titles. 
we would urge that this is given careful consideration. For example, our experience working with Anzac Drive Reserve is that there are many titles within the 11 hectare reserve with a variety of statuses and encumbrances. The land reconfiguration under the GCR Act is an opportunity to cleanse and consolidate these titles to be more readily to more readily enable re regeneration. <coughs> this is an opportunity that should not be missed, but we could be if we but could be if we are not careful. We also note that council will be responsible for all ongoing maintenance costs from the settlement date. We are concerned that the, ma the maintenance of the corridor following the settlement will not be to the same general level of service as currently undertaken. The difference in maintenance in our experience um, between the standards of Crown and council lands um, within the corridor currently is a stark contrast. That is not to say, however, that the maintenance approach could not be improved. For example, to reduce uh, reliance on glyphosate spray for weed management, uh, as well as support the regeneration of indigenous biodiversity. Um, this could also greatly increase the contribution of community volunteer volunteerism in this, via, for example, the community guardians approach. We would also alert you to the fact that there is no recognition in the settlement of the considerable cost of removal of invasive weed species that are prevalent throughout the Crown-owned corridor lands, for example, sycamores, hollies and ivies. So in conclusion, um, yes, the terms of this proposal are somewhat of a compromise. However, we believe it is a workable compromise, giving us a clear uh, foundation to move forward. We urge you to approve the proposal while noting the concerns we have highlighted. This agreement prov provides the certainty of a sound pathway forward that is so dearly needed to unlock the regeneration logjam in the corridor. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any questions? Thank you. I was just looking at the, um, the, the, the specific terms around the Waimakawiri residential red zone, and uh, one of the things that it identifies is the requirement to uh, try and get a, a highest level of economic benefit you know, out of the land as possible. That maximum has, financial return. Maximum financial return. That hasn't been repeated in, in this proposal. So. Would you say that that was a good thing, given, I'm just picking up on your point that you made about the, um, the significance of looking for value that may not be financial? Yes. I, I think this is perhaps an improvement, but I still don't think this is actually sufficient um, protection. I agreed with what Rob Kerr yep. said before, and I think we, the organisation has that view as well. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's something to be aware of, particularly if it's in perpetuity, um, that puts an enormous encumbrance on what's going to happen on the way forward and could actually make things not viable or feasible. Yeah, I think in Waimakawiri it's 999 years. Yeah. It's longer than I'm going to live. <laughs> yeah, likewise. <laughs> um, uh, Phil. Thanks, Evan and Cole. Just around your concerns about invasive weeds in the area, do, are you really saying to us, perhaps as a council, that you'd like to see us give much greater priority to our biodiversity strategy to, to ensure we have you know, safe and sustainable water? Yeah, I, I think there's, a, a, as Carl said, there's a need for a number of strategies with respect to what goes into the red zone from here on out that means there's so, some coherence and um, alignment with everything and integration. Um, what we plant and what we remove is core to that and it's really important. But at the moment um, there's a lot of plants in there that um, are, are, if, if they're allowed to get hold will, uh, that will spread everywhere else. The, I know around where I used to live there's sycamore trees there now that are sprouted from saplings because they haven't been dealt to. Um, and because when we used to live there, we used to mow lawns and weed gardens and stuff like that. Um, so a lot of those plants are taking over in places and they're actually um, out competing some of the natives. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's um, much appreciated. Thank you, Evan. Carl, you can stay there and uh, invite, I think it's Anthony who's coming up to join you. And we're going to hear from the Revolution Tiny House Village Society. Uh, kia ora koutou, obviously I'm Kyle and this is Anthony. Um, kia ora koutou. Today we're speaking on behalf of the Revolution uh, Tiny House Village Society. Uh, to give you all a bit of background on who we are, um, we are the Revolution Tiny House Village Society and we are currently negotiating a five-year transitional lease 
uh, in the residential red zone to trial an intentional tiny house community of uh, 13 homes on wheels. Our vision is to showcase and um, an innovative approach to affordable, low impact, sustainable living on margins of land which are no longer suitable for permanent housing. Our goal is to create a village framework in terms of infrastructure, governance and overarching guiding principles such as biodiversity, community engagement, sustainability and kaitiaki tanga strategies which will all be open source and can be mirrored across New Zealand to help ease some of the pressures which we're currently facing from the enormous housing crisis. We also have a postgrad um, University of Canterbury student working alongside us to help develop this framework in the hopes that it will be useful guidance for other transitional projects and other land uses in the red zone to support coherence and integrity across the corridor. Our proposal closely aligns with the regeneration plan which has the objective of establishing a world leading living laboratory where we learn, experiment and research, testing and creating new ideas and ways of living. However, we have been trying to negotiate a five-year transitional lease in the red zone for over a year now and are now completely stalled because of the Crown through Lynn's not being willing to uh, remove a 30 to 180 day exit clause from the transitional lease agreement. For us, this exit clause prevents us from obtaining necessary funding which relies on a secure five-year term and also prevents, uh, presents too much risk in terms of the potential for 13 households to be made effectively homeless with almost no notice. Unfortunately, we aren't alone. There are other transitional projects in a similar position, unable to secure finance or unwilling to take on such terms, given the level of effort that goes into creating these projects successfully. We therefore endorse the global settlement focus on regeneration momentum, and with frustrations growing within our community, the hope is that the global settlement will provide the breakthrough proposals like ours need. We do, however, have concerns that even with the global settlement, there is likely at least a six-month delay until any transitional progress will be made, with the potential for this to blow out to even a much longer period. Now that there is some clarity on the way forward as provided by the settlement, we request that Council ask the Crown to relax these exit clause lease conditions so projects like ours can get off the ground sooner rather than later. Overall, we endorse the Global Settlement Agreement and would like to congratulate Council negotiators for their hard work to get it to the stage given a very tough um, situation. It is not perfect as we all know, but progress and security about the future is what we desperately need. Our concern, like many others have shared, is in regards to the red zone, um, is that it remains in single ownership with only lease options available for the land in future rather than purchase options. Protections need to be put in place now to ensure that in 20 years' time the land isn't divided up and sold to the highest bidder, but maintained under the single ownership. Many thanks for all your time. Thank you very much. Uh, Glenn? Thank you. Thanks, Kyle. Uh, Hayley and Evan touched on the subject too about roadblocks and specifically uh, that clause. Is that the main, aside from it, it you know, everything else, is this, you know, the main roadblock? That's pretty much the last barrier we're facing, mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Yeah, so a lot of work's gone on to get it to this stage, and Council's been overall very supportive, but, yeah, our main issue now is that exit clause that's mm. preventing us getting funding and obviously anything, everything yeah. else unlocking from that. And interim security, obviously, so... And, yeah, yeah. The security, yeah, yeah, for sure. And, and there's a lot of other transitional projects which are in the same boat, um, given, you know, they could potentially end the pr proposal with, say, 30 days or even 180 days. It's too much risk for a lot of these mm. um, community groups to actually put the effort in or to, to get the funding required. So things are just sitting there waiting. Um, a lot of work's got in to get it to this point, as with a lot of the other projects. And um, so now it's... You know, we're sort of waiting, you know, when can we actually get out and start making things happen, which I think not only the council, but also the community wants to see things take off now. Thank you. Um, I think from my perspective, as a prospective um, a resident of the area, um, I like to just sort of reiterate what Evan was saying, was that the longer that this gets left, the longer the custodians of this area is going to deteriorate, and already that has um, shown up. And, of course, that means more of a burden on to the council as far as maintenance. And um, we believe that, as an asset, the tiny house community, which has got a, a great cross-section of um, people who are wanting to reside there already, from young right through to people like myself, newly retired, um, 
it's going to be a great asset for the uh, revolution area as well as for Avery House and the whole community socially. Mm. I've worked many years at City Mission as a um, AOD uh, uh, and social welfare person, and um, I believe that this is one of the things we need to put repopulate the area with healthy environments which actually are committed to uh, the other residents uh, in that area and also the um, whole belief of um, linking in uh, with the Taha Māori uh, uh, welfare and, and the welfare of the community. Uh, so as a prospective um, person, um, my wife and I, uh, we feel that this is a golden opportunity uh, as a laboratory and to prove that this can be done. It may not suit everybody, but certainly there's many aspects of society which are looking for an alternative way of living comfortably and also contributing back into the community and not isolating into some sort of like little village out in the wop wops. I mean, we are believed that the community should be diverse and this is a great opportunity. Mm. Uh, Aaron Kewan? Um, yeah, so just uh, if you could give us a, a, a brief example of how you see the business model working best for you guys, like going forward, if that's like what you see the land lease is looking like or potential, or you're looking to purchase a patch as a collective, and if not, why not do that elsewhere where there's just not so many problems, like buy a block, put in the units, grow a whole lot of edible gardens, live the dream. <laughs> yeah, uh, it definitely is an option. Um, for us, we see a lot of the opportunity being in the nature of the red zone, being marginal land, which we're going to have a lot more of, not only in Christchurch, but around New Zealand, where the land is so damaged, um, whether it be by earthquakes, whether it be by flooding, um, climate change, where these marginal lands may not be suitable for permanent housing, but they could be suitable for um, options like tiny houses, which actually sit very lightly on the land, low impact, sustainable, and then in the future, say 20, 50 years time, where the land is no longer suitable for even that form of housing, the houses can just be moved off. So it's sort of utilising as much then and testing, uh, while we've got this amazing opportunity in the red zone to test out these sort of concepts and ideas, is actually utilising it. And um, we, we've got no interest in actually purchasing the land. Um, as, as mentioned before, we believe it should still stay under single ownership and just on leasehold basis. And for that, for that, it works best for our community as well. And um, oh, yeah. sorry, Sorry, just economically, what does, uh, how much does the lease work to make the project work for, for, for you guys? And the other one is, instead of Richmond, because we're trying to get people living in the inner city, did you ever consider inside of Fitzgerald Ave? Um, not really inside. I'm not sure. I mean, the, the idea was floated, but I just don't think it fits the nature as well as actually connecting right in with these existing communities. Like, our goal was to connect in and sort of reinvigorate and re um, connect back in with the land, which is a lot of hurt and um, a lot of loss, and, and actually, you know, bring something positive back to these communities and sort of re engage and provide something which we consider to be an asset to the local community where we're inviting people back into a space which currently is um, vacated. Um, what was the other question? Sorry about the lease, about the money. Um, so they, they, uh, how it work is the lease would include um, the going rate for the land as well as um, a rates portion which would just be paid I believe monthly. Um, yeah. I was interested in that comment um, in regard to not been in the central, more in the central city, and I think what Kyle has just mentioned, and I'd like to reinforce that, the fact that you've already got the Richmond community there in Avery House, which has already been established and who is also um, starting to heal, it's a great opportunity for us to uh, be an add-on to that and to fortify that, especially with the community gardens, uh, uh, the, kinder, uh, the, the playground, and also the maintenance of the area, which is regenerating back. So already there's an establishment there which we can dovetail into and um, in so much as buying uh, land further out in that, again, that defeats the fact that we want to be part of the um, Christchurch community and support that and be a, another diverse sector, like you've got the more higher impact building in the city centre itself, and the land value is a lot more uh, expensive there, uh, whereas we're just out on that verge, on the, on the cusp of it, 
but still supporting an already established community. Yeah. Vicky, just a quick... So just in terms of what would need to happen, we would need to get Linz to remove that section that takes you out. Correct, yeah, yep. the exit yep. clause. I mean, there's still, as part of the lease, will be for breach of lease. So if, say, we did mm. something which completely went against what um, the Crown or Council wanted, then there's obviously still that part of any lease agreement. But for the exit, the exit clause itself stands there. If there's any future long-term use that wants to use that space, which we can't foresee anyway, so we can't understand why it's still there. Um, that's pretty much the, the only thing which would be removed here. So we're just asking that that gets negotiated with Lynn's almost as soon as possible so that these things can start getting underway. Cool. Thank you. We will continue trying. <laughs> cool. Thanks very much for your time. And great. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, greening the red zone, Tanya Didham. Good morning. Hi, everybody. Uh, this is my coach here, Celia Hogan, as well. Kia ora. Um, so, thank you for the opportunity to speak uh, on this. The global sediment per se um, is such a huge document, we haven't really had a chance to go through it in this short time frame, but we are most interested in um, Schedule 3 residential red zone land, obviously. Um, cards on the table, we're a community group who has always openly campaigned for the maximum amount of native regeneration in the Otakaro Avon River Corridor. Um, we started out in June 2011. Ashley Campbell founded us uh, with the catch cry of bring Tui back to Christchurch, a common garden bird in most New Zealand cities but missing, uh, <coughs> missing here. Uh, we've learned heaps over these uh, several years. Um, the more we learn about our biodiversity deficit, our endangered species, the quake shifted settling land, um, rising water tables, the history and value of our river and wetland ecosystems, um, green infrastructure, carbon capture, uh, urban flood management, the list goes on, climate change. The more we learn about these things, the more we see the river corridor as an incredible opportunity to innovate there with green and blue um, solutions. Uh, while simultaneously restoring and rejuvenating that river, our habitats, our local species, um, and so on, and an incredible asset, obviously, for the people who live uh, locally. Uh, we, we view the 600 hectares of that space as one entity. Um, it's, it's something that goes from the city to the sea. That's, that's part of the definition, a meaningful urban green space um, for the east, and a, a, a real grand vision of regeneration um, from a profound grief. Um, the Avon River Precinct, just in the city there, has had lots of resources and money poured into it. It's looking great. There's still a wee bit more to come. They're just starting that. Um, but it stops at Fitzgerald Ave. So from Fitzgerald Ave out to the estuary, we want to see an overall management plan that is going to take into account that biodiversity. What do we plant? What do we take out? What, <coughs> what pest animals and plants need to be removed and by whom? Uh, what cultural and aesthetic themes are going to run and weave themselves throughout the whole corridor uh, so that its history and its future are well represented in that space. Um, the overall plan would also include infrastructure <clears throat> such as the stormwater and land drainage, access and pathways, signage, lighting, very important, dark sky lighting, please, um, <coughs> and an overall cohesive connecting space is what we're trying to create there, basically. Um, there's going to be imminently a tremendous need for eco-sourced um, plants and, and volunteers and that's something that Council I think could really step up and um, be, be the network to connect um, communities and resources and make sure everything's done properly according to that biodiversity strategy and those other plans. Um, obviously where the stock banks go is going to be critical in determining where and what we plant in certain places. And I think we need to kind of get on top of that quite quickly. I know that's kind of a bit further down in the LTP, but um, Lynn's actually had a pest species protocol. Uh, they were supposed to be removing some of those invasive large trees. That hasn't really happened, and so they're very happily breeding away in the red zone, matins, holly, sycamores, and all that jazz. Um, so we'd like council to really step up the, um, the maintenance. If they take over, we don't want it to, to slide back to where uh, some of the council parks are. Um, and we'd like to even think bigger in terms of biodiversity and try and incorporate Travis Wetland into the red zone and make that 
incredible eco sanctuary space, which I think Colin will be talking about um, later on. And I'm just going to hand over to Celia to talk more about the governance part of it. Cool. So part of our purpose of coming here today is to share our views on the settlement agreement, but also what this means for the future of the Avon Otakaro River Corridor with regards to governance, leasing and titles. So we do have some concerns around the costs um, and we feel there might be some negotiation required, but um, overall we, we do support the settlement agreement. So we feel that the council need to consider some of the following before making their decision. The settlement agreement must have a short-term transitional governance model to ensure individuals and groups can start activating the corridor. This is essential regardless of what happens. I have also personally given up on a transitional use application as the process changed along the way and we were expected to manage aspects of the application that we believe weren't part of our responsibility. There was also the 30-day clause, which was um, uh, another inhibitor as far as funding. We were also required to get funding before we were able to secure a lease, which uh, you know, it just didn't work <laughs> for our funding applications. We encourage the council to consider the importance of keeping the overall ownership under one entity, for example a trust, however many titles there end up being. Greening the red zone engaged with Forest and Bird in approximately 2016 to produce a report looking into the options of ownership and governance for the Avon River Corridor. The recommendations were that a trust would be the best model. One of the downfalls mentioned was that if council or government were owning the land in full, this could have an impact on attracting philanthropic money, and we thought that was a significant consideration. We support a shared governance model between council, iwi community and stakeholders going forward. While this loosely described model does not rule out ecological expertise at governance level, it does not expressly require it either. We strongly support having an ecological spokesperson as part of a governance structure. With the state of our planet and ecosystem, an ecological presence and governance would seem essential. The green spine should also be kept as one title. A lot of work has gone into the regeneration plan. With a majority of people supporting ecological re restoration as part of the red zone, this will ensure continuity of the space. It may be difficult to keep as one title, but difficult doesn't mean it can't be done. Brendan Anstis said that the council wants to prioritise the green spine, so having one title for this makes sense to us. We support all land use being on a leaseholder basis. This is to eliminate the risk of sell-offs to developers. We also want to encourage faithfulness to regenerate Christchurch regenerate Christchurch's extensive research and consultation, and in particular maintenance and protecting the integrity of the green sign and also the natural aesthetic. We did have some questions around cost. Uh, it wasn't clear to us where all the money is going to come from for maintenance. Yes, there is a sum there that's saying there's a maintenance for period, but there wasn't a breakdown of what Linz is currently paying um, and, and how that translates over, so we were interested in that. Uh, and, and the money that's set aside is just understanding if that's actually enough money to cover the costs for, for an extended period of time or what else is going to be needed, because that's going to fall back on the ratepayers at some stage. We encourage Christchurch City Council to get some more details on the costs, if you don't already have those, and to share that information with uh, ratepayers before a decision is made. We do very much want things to hurry up and get moving, but we feel that that is one area that has not been uh, given to us. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I was just, you might have noticed I was just having a little sidebar with um, uh, Brendan Anstis in relation to the matter about the, the title and he's reminded me that it is the zoning that makes the difference. Um, and so we are awaiting the regeneration plan itself. But the re regeneration plan, because of the extensive consultation and the processes that it's gone under, it's completely in line with the um, Regeneration Act, it can be given effect to in the district plan. So it in, it in itself 
can require us to amend our district plan. So it as does. long as the green spine, it does, yeah, it means the district plan, essentially. We have to give effect to it. So that means that if the green spine, and I believe that it will, because that was made pretty clear in the in the penultimate draft, we haven't seen the final draft, but we're assuming that because of the way the penultimate draft was written, mm. uh, then the green spine will be zoned as such. So uh, that will solve your problem. It doesn't need to be in one title uh, for that purpose. It's okay. the zoning that uh, will be critical. Great. Yeah. Thanks so for we'll that keep clarification. An eye out for that. Mm. Um, Pauline. Thanks. Just quickly, you mentioned the, um, the obnoxious trees. So when we talk about weeds and trees, we've got some in the, in the waterways, but I think you were talking about them on the land. Exactly. And are these in small pockets, or are they distributed right throughout? They're fairly well distributed because obviously people had these things in their gardens. And um, as Evan was saying, without maintenance, they spread really easily. Well, some do. Um, and so there are some specific species, and one of our um, committees done a lot of work on it, um, that are particularly invasive and they need to be removed professionally. They, you can't just go in and hack them down. Yeah. They need to be taken out. And so you're saying that Lynn's failed to maintain those and so we well, will be picking up that work. Yes, it was. In uh, Lynn's did have a protocol to do it, um, but it never seemed to Yes, so we'll be picking it happen. up in addition to the other maintenance. Mm -hmm. Yes. Thank you. Any other questions? Look, thank you very much for your um, submission and thank you, thank you for your thank passion you. um, along with others who have submitted so far. Um, right, so the, uh, we've now come to morning tea time and so uh, we'll take an adjournment and if we could be here at the table ready to start submissions, I'm going to say at 11.18 if the, all councillors could be sitting at the table at 11.18. Thank you. <coughs>
Thank you everyone. If you could take your seats and uh, we shall proceed. If I could have the Richmond Residents and Business Association, uh, Angela Hart. Thank you. Good morning, welcome. Good morning. Thank you for giving us this opportunity sure. to speak. Um, I'm going to talk about from the Richmond Residents Association, and Murray's going to talk about really from the point of view of the jewel and the crown of our area as Avebury House. Um, so we represent the business people and area of Richmond, which is one of the oldest suburbs in Christchurch and has a rich history of cultural significance in the city. After the earthquakes, 27 hectares of Richmond land was designated red zone, depleting the suburb of people and infrastructure. The area also suffered protracted and ongoing flood remediation work and roadworks. Despite this, Richmond is still a suburb alive with a diverse mix of people, community groups, businesses that really want to move on and thrive. We would like to take this opportunity to register our desire to be involved in the regeneration. The global settlement, we think, provides an excellent framework to jumpstart that regeneration and get things going. A priority for many people in Christchurch in general, as well as our suburb. We also endorse the recognition of Te Ranga e Naitahu as an important partner in the process. We are looking to contribute to, in a significant and substantive manner with Council and all affected parties. <coughs> to provide a solid future for the zone, its neighbours and Christchurch as a whole. A future we hope will be secured legally, financially and maintained into perpetuity for the benefit of all. all. Um, we value our contacts that we've been making and working relationships with the council and other interested parties in the last 18 months. A lot has been achieved and we would like to continue doing this. We would like to act as a conduit within the community from the, to assist in the regeneration from the bottom up and not the top down. Ideally, the regeneration process should be won by the people, with the people and for the people of Christchurch. To this aim, we believe a truly collaborative process between council and all stakeholders should be established. With equal emphasis on all concerned stakeholders as well as council staff, we believe this is an opportunity to show everyone how things can be done. We have a unique opportunity here to do some amazing things and provide a truly successful outcome for the city. Rather than the seemingly generic consultation process, which has been the norm, the outcome of which often seems to have been predetermined in the past, we've got a chance to do things differently. We're particularly consonant of the following in relation to Richmond and the settlement. The Otakau avon River Corridor reconfiguration. The red zone in our area runs along the river and thus we're vulnerable to flooding and that all spread on an ongoing process. There are still roads in our area which dissect the red zone and inhabited homes along the fringes of the red zone where the street just comes to a complete stop. These will be directly affected by the changes in over, in over or lack of development. Some roads are still used as thoroughfares or walking trails, changes to them or to their ability to allow people to move across the red zone to other neighbouring suburbs will have a serious impact on Richmond. Environmental management plan. It is pleasing to see that the settlement includes this. Richmond had, before the earthquake, a number of green spaces, formal and informal. Some significant areas of flora, including native areas, and at least one entry in the significant tree list. Since the earthquake, some of these have been neglected or lost to natural events or intensive development. Preserving and developing the zone in an environmentally sensitive manner is essential, cons with consideration being given to the existing knowledge and uses of the land within and by the community. Creating a sustainable management plan is the ideal. Um, and we also 
want to talk about adjacent communities because we're not the only area that abuts the red zone. Developing the red zone in isolation to adjacent communities in the city as a whole could prove to be short-sighted and limited in its long-term survival and sustainability. Providing a cohesive regeneration plan that includes them all as a whole will support these areas as well as supporting the long-term success of the regeneration. It could also be a stimulus to reactivate the master plans to redevelop areas in the eastern suburbs which seem to have stalled. True consultation and collaboration, taking on board the community's ideas and goals, allowing the community to lend its skills and efforts in a genuine and constructive manner, can only enhance the success of the regeneration project. And Murray's going to talk on behalf of Avebury House, which is one of the really successful areas in our area that's already been developing, as you've heard itself. Um, kia ora koutou. Um, Avebury House is a uh, pivotal council-owned asset sitting right on the threshold uh, of the red zone. It's ideally located as an anchor point or hub for the regeneration activity um, and in fact considerable regeneration activity has already occurred around Averbury uh, with much more coiled and ready to spring forth um, once appropriate permissions are available. Some of this will be a little repetitive, you've most likely heard it again and again. Um, the staff and the trust board uh, of Averbury House Community Trust are immersed in the action at this location um, and fully support the passion, energy and most of all the get it done attitude of the people that are active in this space. Um, and there are many groups, most of whom you will have heard from or will hear from today. Um, Richmond is currently a focal point for these people and their passion. However, all are committed to a much uh, broader seeding of the same passion in other locations around this beautiful city um, and areas that are yet to be activated. So it's, it's almost like a, a beta test site, if you like. Um, it's a particularly disappointing um, that we have had some feedback um, that, uh, second hand essentially, that Richmond's received too much attention um, or has had too many leases granted by Lynn's, um, suggesting that there's a resistance um, or a tame the natives type attitude from some of the bureaucracy in various places. Don't know if that's real or not, but it's certainly been heard. Um, and basically, we don't get the same sense from our elected members, which is terrific. Um, um, well, we, we do hope um, that uh, these community groups or individuals will be encouraged, supported and uh, heralded as pioneers and waymakers of the regeneration because that's exactly what they are. Um, the Trust has particular, uh, a few particular comments for consideration. First of all, congratulations and well done. Getting the, um, getting the uh, global settlement over the line is the first and most important part to bringing uh, this part of Christchurch back to us and back into our control. Um, secondly, you will have heard effective governance is a concern for all, and we're hearing that across the board from uh, all of our constituents that, uh, that, that um, sit around Averbury. Um, governance of the, the land and the projects upon it, um, important that uh, local community representation um, within that structure is vital to ensure uh, adoption, acceptance and um, execution of these projects going forward. We'd love to see uh, governments being separated from council bureaucracy, perhaps handled by something independent, I think you've heard that already, uh, with representation selected from local and uh, other lo local communities and other stakeholders. Um, we'd like consideration to the executive team responsible for uh, development and maintenance of the residential red zone reporting to and being held accountable by an independent, govern govern an independent governance board. Um, we'd state that engagement must be collaborative and not consultative. Um, we, as a group, collectively grow quite tired of faux consultation processes designed to rubber stamp activity and outcomes that are already predetermined in our view. Um, Allocation of funding for projects needs a new approach uh, designed to maximise community passion and um, in-kind contribution because that can have a massive effect on how quickly and uh, how cost-effectively um, this thing can be brought to fruition. Um, the Averbury House Community Trust is not thrilled but accepting um, of the potential for deep-pocketed corporate or other interest groups to take control of certain parts of the regeneration process. What we want to make sure, though, is that through 
collaboration and consultation understanding um, that doesn't uh, dominate and roll over the top of community interest because uh, we are very active, we're very passionate and committed to making this uh, a success. Um, we are too concerned about upkeep and maintenance and making sure that that does not uh, degrade following handover to council. That's not a criticism. Obviously, it's an expensive, um, expensive part of the process. What we would like council to consider is that via engagement with communities, not just ours but others, there may be some more cost-effective ways of dealing with maintenance as long as the parcels or packets of land to be maintained are not too big. If you go for big areas, then communities won't be able to assist. But if you break it down into smaller packages, the likes of the Richmond Community Garden and others associated may well be able to achieve some quite good results around maintenance in a localised area, the likes of Richmond. Um, Really, uh, the speed with which this has all happened uh, was a little surprising, making things a wee bit hard to digest and comment meaningfully. Um, however, we are hopeful that that's indicative of a uh, let's go get it done attitude going forward, uh, because we certainly support that. Time for talks over, time for action is here. We want to be part of that. Um, and if you're seeing a commonality of view, passion, and indeed a commonality of people across uh, conversations today, uh, that's no accident. That's how we roll in Richmond. That's how we'd like to take it out to other parts of the city that haven't quite got off their bums yet. <laughs> <laughs> Dinner, Queen. It, it's just perfect, and it's just it come to the end of the ten minutes. But you just, you just summed it. I love that uh, the way that you just wrapped it all up there. Um, thank you very much for your submission. It's um, yeah, no, it certainly does reflect what we've listened to this morning in terms of um, the community wanting us to get on with this. You're welcome. So, thank you very Dinner. much. Right, the next is uh, Eastern Vision with Peter Beck and Evan Smith. Uh, kia ora tato. Kia ora. Uh, nga hawe whana iwi e taonei, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. Uh, first of all, uh, I, it's, it's really nice to be in these hallowed precincts again. And I pay my respects to this chamber and to all of you, uh, councillors, and the work that you do. Uh, I'm wearing a dog collar. I don't wear one, yes, wear one very much I'm a bit these days. By yeah, yeah, no. Uh, it's yeah. just I like to implicate the church in what I'm doing. <laughs> <laughs> Tom McBrayt, he says, because I've only got two ties and they're both out of fashion. That's, <laughs> that's where we are. Um, I'm. Thank goodness I, it's only the church sure. and not God. <laughs> I am also a very proud resident of Richmond, and so I want to uh, endorse a whole lot that's been said before today, all of it, really. Um, and what, because it largely comes from my end of this, our end of the city, it is indicative though, however, of a whole lot of other buds that are springing up across the corridor and across the city. So don't just think it's us in Richmond just doing it all here. In a sense, we speak on behalf of many, many more people, as I'm sure you're all aware. Um, it's so good, actually, before I really get into it, to hear the comments that many have made, and, and particularly yours, Your Worship. I really appreciate the comments you'll be making here this morning. Thank you for the opportunity to comment on the settlement, and it's good to have Evan as part of this with me because he is part of Eastern Vision, just as I'm part of Avon Otaka Network. It's been eight and a half years since that fateful day on the 22nd of February, 2011. As we all know, the impact on virtually every one of us who lived or live here in this city at that time has been traumatic. This is particularly true for those who lived or continue to live in the East. The trauma and frustration has gone on and on over the years as the various government and local agencies have struggled and striven with each other over who makes decisions about what. Who tells who what to do around here? Who is leading us into our future? Let alone, alongside that, the intense angst and conflict over insurance and EQC processes and outcomes. Grassroots folk have striven really hard to make sure that the voice of those whose spirit, whose wairua, is immersed in the land, whose story of family and community life, whose life and energy and possessions are soaked into the land in the East, is heard and helped to shape the future. You may remember that Cancern was born out of the need for communities to have a voice in making just decisions. 
There has been angst and frustration for all of us in this, not least, of course, for you guys, our city councillors and your staff. And there has also been breathtaking and exciting initiatives generated by local communities, social entrepreneurs, grassroots entrepreneurs, those who hold dear the ecological, social and environmental core of these lands and the villages of which they're made. And for all of this, many thanks to all those elected officials, staff of the various agencies, both statutory and voluntary, not-for-profits who work for the well-being of our city and its future. But I suggest to you that people are tired. The frustration of delay and confused leadership means that many have given up and gone. And we already heard from some this morning that some are on the edge of that, unless things happen soon. If we continue to delay, more will follow. We're all too aware of the degree of mental health issues that are ongoing for so many people in our area. We are straining for a clear path forward that embraces all of us. The global settlement is a compromise. With hindsight, we can criticize what decisions were made between Crown and City Council and the plethora of agencies that have determined our decision-making processes and outcomes. Yes, it is not ideal and many would want to delay and relitigate for justifiable reasons. Yes, the timing of it has been regrettable. The time for public consultation and engagement too brief. Should we delay to seek what might be a more equitable and just outcome for our city? I don't think so, actually. With a local election almost upon us and a national election next year, there's no certainty that we'll be able to get what might be a better, better settlement for a considerable time. And we need to move to action where at present we are stalled. So Eastern Vision would like to commend the team, Brendan and Andrew and others, for negotiating the settlement. In our view, at last it provides a clear pathway forward for the regeneration of Christchurch, and in particular for us, of course, the regeneration of the East. It's not a perfect outcome, but it does provide a good, solid basis to enable locally-led regeneration in a timely manner, something which we haven't seen much of in the East of late. We endorse the proposed outcomes with their focus on people, momentum, value, and future. We particularly value the focus on people and community. However, while we support outcomes for the people of Christchurch, we remind, we remind Council this can only be achieved with and by the people of Christchurch. In your success in resuming local control, do not limit this to the Council. There must be an ongoing devolution and dialogue with the community as these outcomes unfold at each step of the way. That is true local leadership. We also endorse the focus on momentum. This is critical to the regeneration of the River Corridor, as pointed out by Evan and the Avon Attacker Network and others who've spoken this morning. The current stalling of momentum has resulted in the loss of really good opportunities and really good people. We can't afford to let this continue. We strongly endorse the phased approach to increasing community involvement in the governance and decision making regarding transitional land use in the residential red zones and key roles for Naitahu and Manafenua in this. However, this must support and not compromise the corridor regeneration plan. And it must be undertaken with good strategic oversight that provides leadership, drive, coherence, and integration geographically and across sectors with clearly defined timeframes and funding. And this needs to include the involvement of communities and stakeholders in decisions about what transitional and long-term governance could look like and how land parcels are defined and the order in which they're conveyed. We do endorse the residential red zone agreement to transfer the lands for a dollar. However, we are concerned about what you've heard also this morning about the demand by the Crown for a 50% cut of any economic return from lease or sale. I don't actually believe the Crown have lost a lot in what's <coughs> happened, if anything, in what's happened over the last few years. 
the potential for them to man such economic, so 50% of a cut of economic return from lease or sale has the potential, as you heard earlier, to undermine local control and to shift the focus of any project onto economic return only, rather than the multiple bottom line benefits that we know about. Like Avon, we understand the need for multiple titles. However, we also strongly urge single public ownership for the, the, Red, the River Corridor, not only to preserve the integrity of the Green Spine, but also the integrity of the whole corridor as a multi-purpose river park. We don't believe any of the land should be shaved off a of private sale to raise revenue at any point in the future. All land uses can be achieved via leasehold arrangements. We have seen how pressures have been put on, for instance, Hagley Park and other great parks around the world to have, have parts sold off for purposes which don't mean to meet the integrity of the guiding vision. We note that there's nothing in settlement either to address the costs of any outstanding earthquake legacy issues in the eastern suburbs, for instance, New Brighton Business District, Linwood Village, South New Brighton and South Shore, and outstanding infrastructure repairs such as the Pages Road Bridge and Swans Road Bridge. We trust that Council will take all these into account into prioritising funding in annual and long-term planning processes in the future. However, despite these concerns and initial limitations, we, in all of this, we think that this is a settlement we need to support, deserves your approval, so that we can get on with the job of regenerating the East with the communities of the East as soon as possible. And I've hardly left you any time to make any comment. Thank you, Your Worship. Sure, uh... Well, you're the first one that um, I've been able to ask this question to, but um, you were a councillor when the cost-sharing agreement was uh, confirmed <laughs> Indeed. in a um, non-public setting with no input from Correct. the public at all. Correct. This is not this is not a submission process. This is simply the deputations Indeed. that are allowed at a public meeting, and you know the process. Um, and we've, we've, we've allowed, we've actually provided for the deputations to happen a couple of days before the meeting itself, so that we've got time to reflect on what people have to say. Um, and so uh, what, what I'm hearing from you is a very strong message of, you know, could it have been better? Yes. Do we need to get on with it? Yes. Hmm. Um, should we delay it? No. That's exactly where I sit on this. And I'm really delighted that you're having the meeting on Thursday in public. Yes. It's really important. Yeah, that we're live stream that. for those that can't make it. Absolutely. Yep. Absolutely. <laughs> okay. All right. Look, thank you very much thank for your you. presentation. Much appreciated. So, uh, Tuesday Club, Gary Moore. Kia ora. Kia ora, Mayor and Councillors, and I can assure you I come with no church blessing. Um, <laughs> what, about oh, the <laughs> what about the church? Ask the last bishop. Ask the last bishop if he's still got that blessing. Anyway, I'm pleased to see that we're, this is in front of us at long last. I have a number of concerns that I wish to cover. The document states that the government has spent $14 billion in Christchurch. That is a gross figure, and if you take the amount of taxes and revenue that the government earned as a result of expenditure on repairing our city, I suspect that you as a council and the state have spent about the same amount of money. The second point is I have no faith at all in the financial assumptions in your paper. Bruce White will be covering this matter, but I recommend that you take a close look at the financial figures. How can you make any decisions without financial figures? Do you really know what the actual costs of what are being handed over right now are? And have you confidence that the numbers in the annual plan and long-term plan are sufficient? I would say that the estimates have not been subject to rigorous scrutiny. Having no financial documents is not the way to conduct public affairs. Which leads me to A. Section 77 of the Local Government Act states that you as elected reps are required to identify and assess all reasonably practical solutions. And that defines under section 77 1 A, B, C and A, B and C what you have to do as a council, and that is not covered in this paper. 
This is a section which was tested in the Council of Social Services and Christchurch City Council case in 2009. The High Court found that as well as failing to consult that the Council had failed to assess all reasonably practicable options and that a thorough analysis of the reasonably practicable options was required. The report only presents one option that's in front of you. Madam Mayor, are you listening? You have to agree to a proposal and no other options are identified or assessed. You are in breach of the ruling of the High Court in 2009. This puts your council in considerable risk of a judicial review. If I were sitting in your seats, this would cause me to pause and seek a further urgent legal opinion. B. Somehow this decision to be considered has been deemed of medium significance. I then check section 97 of the Local Government Act and the section states certain decisions to be taken only if provided for in the long term plan and it covers about the decision to transfer assets. Then I checked your tests of significant <laughs> significance policy. The relevant section for the test of significance says the degree of importance of the issue, proposal, decision or matter as assessed by the Council in terms of its likely impact on and likely consequences for the district or region, any persons who are likely to be particularly affected by or interested in the matter, the capacity of the local authority to perform its role and the financial and other costs of doing so, as described by the Local Government Act. Again, if I were sitting in your seats, I would not feel this item is of minor, medium significance. The transfer of massive tracts of land in the red zone, coastal and in the Port Hills, should probably trigger a special LTP consultative process, despite the Council saying it has provided for the costs in the last long-term plan. I'm not sure whether or not the cost estimates are correct or not. I suspect not. But costs are only one part of this test. Who has assessed the capacity of the local authority to perform its role? I believe that the test of whether or not this matter is of medium significance has been made in error. I believe that the Council will need to call for submissions on the likely impact or consequences of the land being handed over. A further test of whether these are strategic assets is covered in the City Council policy where it sta states that asset assets are seen as strategic if they are part of all parks and reserves owned by or administered by the Council. That fits it again. Then it states, where a strategic asset is a network or has many components, decisions may be made in respect of individual components within the network without those components being regarded as strategic. And the next bit is the interesting bit. Unless such decisions are considered to significantly alter the level of service provided by the Council. Inheriting the whole of the red zone must significantly alter the levels of service provided by this Council. In my opinion, if this recommendation is wrong, the elected Council must consult the public on this strategic asset. Eight days notice is not consultation. And fourth point, for the life of me I cannot understand why your negotiators did not play hardball on the number of agencies which currently manage this city. They frustrate us all. All that's covered is about the demise of Regenerate Christchurch. Why didn't you advocate for one agency in Christchurch by the end of June next year? Why didn't you negotiate that this city wants DPMC and Otakaro gone by then? They cost millions every year. The government is going to establish an urban development authorities around New Zealand. 
This is an ideal time for this council to take control of what we need in this city to control it down here and not be told by Wellington what they're going to do to us. So in conclusion, I'm not sure what the rush is for this settlement. I think the document in front of us is inadequate at best. It has huge shortcomings both from a financial and legal perspective as well as not providing options for you to consider and again, if I were in your position, I'd be very, very worried about judicial reviews which could delay things even further. There have been a lot of really good people making submissions here today, urging get on with it. I applaud their interest and their commitment to our city. They aren't wrong. I just say make haste slowly and get it right. There will be time for all of their ideas to be implemented. Do not dismiss my arguments because you have a sense of urgency. I'm only here because I care about the long-term sustainability of our city. I'm concerned that the proposal as it stands has potential to put rates up massively and central government needs to be playing its role to assist the ratepayers of this city who have suffered enough since the 2010 earthquake. I will finish by asking you all, is this a deal done? Or can we make a difference? Have you allowed sufficient time for today's submissions to be considered? Do you have sufficient time to make changes if you want to? Thank you. And by the way, I apologise, Chris McKenzie was coming with me, but he's in a ministerial meeting. Yeah, no, I had a meeting with him last week, yep. so I've caught up with his views. Um, the, uh, just to repeat, these are not submissions, they're deputations on the paper which is being heard on Thursday. Sarah. Thank you. Um, I won't address the, the legal stuff, I'm sure that we'll get advice on that, but when it comes to um, taking more time, going back, renegotiating, those kind of things, what is it that you see we may have, say, leverage with? So we're not teachers, we're not you know, the police, whoever, we can't just withdraw labour and put some pressure on the government, right? Yeah. So what is it that you see we would use as leverage that we don't have already that might encourage the government to think differently or put more in? I, look, first of all, I've got to say very few people are tragic enough to have read this paper. Okay, yeah, so, yeah. so, But if you get it wrong, a lot of people will take huge interest. Absolutely. And I'd say that I would be asking for the Crown to be showing us what their costs actually are and what their forward budgets actually were. Yeah. And you haven't got that in front okay, of you. But, but away from the financial stuff... Well, the financial stuff I know, I know we, we want it, right? So then there's been due diligence on some on stuff being done, yep. but what motivation can we use for the government to potentially give us more, if you like? Because they're um, clearly selling the story nationwide and the cabinet are all kind of clear that you know they've spent 14 billion. We disagree with that clearly. Yes, yes. But what leverage is there that we can use? Oh, I, first of all, I think we've got to put our, our minds into Megan Woods's position. Mm. She's a cabinet minister against a whole lot of Auckland cabinet ministers mm -hmm. and I think what you can be doing is by actually saying to the public of Christchurch actually we think we could have done better and we and I personally I don't agree with the way you've gone about it a team of four people who were virtually not accountable until the document came in front of you and I think that document's inadequate and I think you need to be opening it up so that, in fact, more people can have input because you will find there are a lot of people who actually are very concerned and will give great feedback. So you think that's putting pressure on local MPs in the lead-up to an election year? Absolutely. OK. So we'll wait till... Yeah. Okay. Right, so look, thank you very much. The time's up. But look, thank you for what you're doing at the Tuesday Club. It's, um, I mean, we don't always see eye to eye on issues, but... I'd um, be disappointed you if You would be did. terribly disappointed yep. if I agreed with everything that you um, said. Uh, but I do agree with the fact that um, having public debate around issues is important. But this is not a submission process, so it's a deputation process on a paper the last time a paper of this nature came before council, it was done in PX before um, 
back in 2013, and that's the that's the issue that we're confronted with. My argument is two wrongs don't make a right. No, I, I, I agree right with either. that, but I also think that it's important that we um, find a way of moving on. So anyway, thank but thank you. Bruce White. Right. Uh, good morning, and uh, thank you for uh, allowing me a few minutes to uh, just say a few bits and pieces. Uh, some of you may have read what I wrote in the Tuesday Club Notes, an opinion piece prior to the settlement uh, being declared, uh, where I expressed a, a concern about urgency and the eight-day or ten-day period. And uh, I call that piece a, a false sense of urgency because We've gone on uh, now for six years since the, uh, the first global settlement, and it's now eight, uh, eight and a half years, as Peter uh, Beck has just pointed out. And a lot of things haven't been urgent. And I don't want to hold anything up, because um, I want things to happen, particularly in the red zone, and I've been one of the proponents of one of the larger projects. So I really don't want to hold things up. But the sense of what's going on at the moment concerns me. Uh, I guess I'd just say in terms of urgency, a real sense of urgency moving forward really involves, in my view, uh, full participation by the public and really harnessing the depth of, uh, of capabilities that exist in our community. I think that's really, really important and not uh, driving it just from within uh, council. Having said that, um, uh, I don't fully understand what has been negotiated. And Gary uh, just mentioned uh, that I'm going to cover uh, the finance in detail. Uh, well, he's got it completely wrong. We didn't discuss it. I'm not going to discuss it in any detail at all because there is no detail. And I am completely staggered that in this um, uh, document, uh, the agenda paper that we've seen, uh, there is no financial summary. None whatsoever. <coughs> yes, there are notes, and they refer to different uh, amounts of dollars, and et cetera, et cetera, but there is no summary. Yes, the figures might be included in annual plans and long-term plans, you people and the council staff are fully immersed in this day by day. As a member of the public, like other members of the public, I'm not immersed in it. And to see a document that doesn't have a, a financial summary with cross-referencing, I find is just not good enough. And I say that, I come from, I guess, a, a part of my history in the past has been as a chief financial officer and I wouldn't dare put up something uh, without uh, a full financial table that people can... I guess the, the, the real point is to make it easy for people to understand. Because this is not simple, it's complex. So the easier you can make it, the better off everyone is. I'll say no more on that, uh, except I would like to see a financial summary published, and I don't think it should be too hard. Uh, a couple of uh, sort of just other uh, points, the time frames uh, for the red zone. I keep hearing this thing about it being a generational and taking years, and I just don't buy it whatsoever. Um, frankly, uh, it's 600 hectares of fairly flat land. It's got, uh, we know there's issues around climate change and flooding and that sort of thing. It's the size of 10 golf courses. This is not the biggest deal in terms of land mass for anyone that's dealt with uh, large spatial areas. And, and I think we've got to stop talking about it being generational. Um, yes, trees take time to grow, of course they do. We need to get on with it, but it's not too hard to plan. Uh, and the other com uh, component that concerns me about the red zone is Lynn's 
uh, and the time frame uh, to actually clear the titles. And it seems to me that uh, instead of operating their normal processes, they should be urged to uh, redesign their systems to cope with this and get it done. That's all I have to say. Thank you, and I agree about having the, um, the overview of the financials, and a lot of them are there already just to be pulled out of LTPs and things. Do you understand that, um, so if we're looking at the residential red zone and trying to get some financial summaries about what the potential costs are for putting in um, you know, various bits of infrastructure, if you like, for flood protection and things, that until some detailed design would be done, we, it would be very, very difficult to come up with uh, an estimated cost for that work? I completely understand. Yeah, yeah, but in yeah, the risk yeah. to councillors, if we put in a, an estimated amount, which is what we've done in the, the long-term plan, yeah. then people assume that that's been a fully costed, and when it's a different cost later on, council wears it for, you Look, know... Of course, yeah. it, it must be an estimate. I think the estimate I've seen is quite large. It's quite large, yeah. And I find it too large. But without... That's my you know, gut feeling. Yeah. Yeah. I think people um, in the past we've heard have a problem though if we put it in too light and then it, well, they, they call well, it a blowout course. later of when course. we didn't know. Of course. Yeah. yeah. But it, you just want those things pulled out of the LTPs and put into one document. Just um, to be more, more explicit. What, what the original cost share had divvied up and then well, what the future stuff is. There's various ways you can do it. Yeah. But I'm not going to go back and search annual plans and long-term plans and I don't have the time. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Thank you very much um, for your presentation, and uh, we appreciate that. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, uh, Waitakere Eco Sanctuary, Dr. Colin Merck. Yeah. He apparently wants me to join him. <laughs> Good. <laughs> this wasn't quite intended, but um, I presume I can bring this up here, can I? Yep, should be able to. <coughs> Coming up on my screen. Um, yep. I'm just trying to. Oh, there we go. Ooh. Ooh. Okay, yep, there we go. That's better. Right, um, kia ora, councillors. Um, <clears throat> I'm I'm here as a proud Kiwi, um, Otautahi Cantabrian, um, and co-chair with Bruce here of the Waitakere Eco Sanctuary supporters. Um, and the purpose for our deputation really is to keep the Eco Sanctuary as a critical asset for the city, uppermost in the minds of council as you move forward to your new role with the, with the red zone. Um, <clears throat> in general, um, we support um, a number of the other submissions that have been made. We know from Greening the Red Zone, Avon Otakaro Forest Park, of which I'm members, um, <clears throat> and note that um, the importance of um, a, a representative governance structure that, that reflects uh, mana whenua community stakeholders and statutory authorities, of course. Um, but um, I personally would add the need for key competencies uh, reflected in the, in the governance structure. And I know that others don't always agree with that particular point, but uh, I think it is important to have all of those lenses in these critical decision-making roles. Um, <clears throat> there's, um, the, the time now is uh, to recognise um, what is in fact the most popular and most economic big project that's been put forward for the um, residential red zone, the Waitakere Eco Sanctuary, because this um, will add real important critical value to the city and to the red zone, um, tangibly averting um, the ecological emergency, which I know the council has declared, uh, but also, importantly, supporting local business through being a component of um, you know, a bold new approach to an eco-city. And this will happen through um, landscape and a cultural halo effect, that is, wildlife will spread from a sanctuary out into the surrounding um, neighbourhoods and uh, forage and the, and the food supplies there, um, <clears throat> but also there is a strong... Um, people halo effect, that is the interaction of people with wildlife, which um, starts to overcome what we've experienced, uh, the extinction of experience of our natural heritage. Of course, this will require some sort of practical decisions about the um, way in which the red zone is managed, in particular um, the location um, of stock banks, for example, 
um, and the managing of um, sea level rise as we expect, um, which uh, may ultimately require some sort of strategic retreat. But this will provide a stepping stone through space and time. It will provide that halo effect through space, but also it will be a stepping stone towards um, some future state of, of, the, of the region. Um, one of the other um, sort of uh, bullet points, I suppose, is that I note that the way in which the existing um, regeneration plan depicts the important area of the um, eco-sanctuary area um, south of Travers Road, south of Travers Wetland, um, shows that pretty much all is wetland. Um, whereas really, um, of course, this is one of the critical areas of potential forest um, for the eco-sanctuary, um, but it also includes um, uh, major community um, planting projects that have been carried out by, uh, for the Mahinga Kai exemplar, for example, and by even Otaku Forest Park, who are leasing some of that um, land for planting now. So, uh, just very briefly, why a sanctuary? Well, New Zealand is, a, and Canterbury, a biodiversity hotspots, uh, but extinction capitals. Um, we need to avert the biodiversity ecological emergency, which has been declared. Um, <clears throat> we have to have practical steps towards overcoming uh, that emergency. Um, and it's part of a big overall vision for um, a national park city for Christchurch. Um, uh, you can Google that, find out more about it, but it includes the 360 trail, which you know about, the Eco Sanctuary, um, joining up um, <clears throat> trails and nature throughout the city, and importantly, um, bringing uh, people and nature into a much more connected environment through um, <clears throat> a sort of a matrix of, of uh, patches, uh, corridors connecting them, um, and of course, a sensitive. Ma um, ecologically sensitive matrix in between where people live and have access to um, frequent interaction with nature. And we know this is critical for um, meeting all of those well-beings that uh, current ideas about you know, the economy need to reflect. So it's one thing having uh, habitat patches, forest patches scattered through, which we've got some of and which we're increasing um, through community plantings and plantings in the red zone. But without an actual fence sanctuary, like is proposed here, um, uh, based around the uh, legacy wetland reserve, which was of course um, um, designated by this council um, 30, <coughs> 20, 20 uh, odd years ago, um, <clears throat> we, need, we can only then have these iconic charismatic wildlife um, available for um, direct experiential connection with, with the people of Christchurch. Canterbury, in fact, is the only region in the country that doesn't have this experience available to its citizens and, and residents, let alone its visitors, which can then sort of generate um, tourist uh, traffic, eco-tourist traffic. Just a few images showing some of the kinds of creatures which we can um, expect when we do this. And th this is already demonstrated at Zealandia and Wellington and around the, um, uh, the, the islands, offshore islands around Auckland and of course um, uh, um, the Orokanui Reserve in, um, in Dunedin and, and also um, in, in Nelson. Every other region of the country has got these um, growing experiences, and it has that halo effect. It has this reinforcing effect on people's um, sense of belonging to their special and unique um, biodiversity. Um, <clears throat> and um, thank you, Evan, for having um, uh, put some of these uh, graphics together in the past. Um, but it shows all of the kind of wonderful things that sort of spin off. Not only um, wildlife, uh, people's interaction with it but um, uh, hitting, getting involved with uh, children, nature play, and all those kinds of things. There is a mower up there on the top right. Maybe we'll get one of those there one day. I'm not sure. <clears throat> OK, so when we have this eco-city, which we, you know, uh, a lot of us have been promoting for a long time, um, there's a new movement, international movement, called the National Park City Movement. And in fact, London has just declared itself uh, uh, this status, wouldn't it be great if Otautahi was the first city in New Zealand to declare itself a national park city? We've got the diversity. We know from a recent um, global city nature challenge, 
Christchurch has got the biodiversity, it's got the landscape, it's got the recreational um, uh, infrastructure. Um, and the important thing about declaring this is that it does um, create a particular reason and purpose and framework for getting people more involved and connected to nature, which is going to be a critical thing in terms of um, you know, ecological literacy amongst the public in terms of uh, the way we future manage our, our um, not only our country, uh, but also the earth. Everything, we like to think that everything is connected, but we need to do more to connect, reconnect people and nature experientially, culturally, but also economically. So I believe that the red zone is going to be one of those places, and I hope that in your moving forward towards um, uh, um, uh, some sort of role, uh, important role in, in managing and, and governing this area that, um, <clears throat> that you will bear these ideas in mind and make this a, a central core to Christchurch being that eco-city. Thank you. We've got a minute left, so um, questions? I think... Yes, Sam. Hi. Hi, Colin. Thank you, Sam. So Just um, in terms of the national park idea. Yes. Do you, and, and I'm thinking of, of money and funding. Would the Crown, could we access Crown support for that in any way, do you think? <clears throat> Being well, a national park. Yes. Mm. Well, well, I think things like the Eco Sanctuary are a key component of giving it that kind of status and providing the, the sort of ecological um, underpinning of, of such a status. But I, I just briefly mentioned this Global City Nature Challenge. We use citizen science to record the number of uh, species in the whole city at the end of April over four days. And out of the global, um, out of 170 cities in the world that took part in this competition, Christchurch, when adjusted for population and area, was in the top five um, in terms of the number of species. So, you know, Christchurch has never promoted itself as a kind of like a, a biodiversity hotspot, but it's got as many native species growing or living wild in our city, despite, you know, the huge human impact, as our national parks have. Um, and we need to kind of celebrate this and, um, and, 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 and embrace it, I think. And a national park city is just sort of creates a brand, if you like, around which that, those things can be protected and celebrated and, um, and, and contribute to people's learning about um, the natural world that they um, are dependent on. Excellent. Look, thank you. Um, you know, and I mean, this area is just so valuable. I um, really appreciate what you've been doing in, in Travis Wetlands. And it's a, it's a good, good vision to come to the table with. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, and I've got Central City Business Association, Brendan Chase. That red zone does sound like it's got a very exciting future for the city. Yeah, it does. Uh, Mayor, councillors, thank you for the opportunity to speak to you today. Um, I'm Brendan Chase, Chairman of the Central City Business Association. Probably firstly comment that we support the written submission of the New Zealand Property Council. Um, but I also note that full and final settlements have a history of not being full and really being final. Um, the CCBA has over has more than 400 members and over 90% of our, members, uh, of our members are businesses rather than property owners. So we can offer a slightly different or additional perspective um, on the Global Settlement Agreement to the Property Council. The central city remains a challenging environment for retail and hospitality businesses in particular. And the fact is that this is likely to continue to be the case for some time to come. The delivery of the anchor projects has become <coughs> drawn out and it's taking much more time than was originally expected and stated. 
and businesses have made decisions to come into the central city based on those original projections. The effects and costs to businesses of these delays, in our view, cannot be disassociated from the anchor projects. Actually, to, to, to do so would almost be cognitive dissonance. The blueprint object, or one of the blueprint objectives is to restore and establish primacy of the central city business district. And we would argue that this uh, actions are strong actions are required to achieve this now, that it doesn't begin with the completion of the last anchor project. So in this regard, we suggest that the Global Settlement Agreement should acknowledge this by including fiscal capacity to fund activation activities, uh, attraction in initiatives, and in some instances, relief, relief initiatives through until the last of the anchor projects are completed, and perhaps slightly beyond. The Central City Action Plan um, addresses some of these matters. Uh, the Council and the CCBA have just undertaken a retail review of the Central City, and we're about, you'll hear about that tomorrow at the Development Forum meeting. Um, our plea is that these matters be given adequate resourcing um, because although the Global Settlement Agreement is about things, people are also incredibly important. The excess, so he, here's a few comments or facts just uh, ancillary to all of that. The accessible city has actually, um, and you won't like to hear this, has alienated a large portion of the Christchurch population. The Central City Business Association has always been a supporter of the accessible city plan, but there's much work to be done to educate uh, the Christchurch population of how the city might function in the future and that it's not the same as in the past. Premises costs are high for businesses in the central city, much higher than they were pre-earthquake. Retail offering is still incomplete. It's, it's become hard to attract new businesses to the central city. Um, two years ago, uh, national consultants basically just started instructing international retailers and Australasian retailers to give Christchurch a wide berth. Uh, there's a tough operating environment in the central city, especially for small businesses, uh, some of which are failing. <coughs> I received an email yesterday from an owner of a property in the central city saying yet another of his retailers is closing the door. Um, the East Frame is, hasn't delivered the residential population boost that's promised, and it looks like that's going to take a very long time to be complete. Um, and suburban malls are expanding. You'd be all be aware that uh, Miravale Mall uh, has submitted, or the owners of Miravale Mall have submitted a, an application to expand, and we understand it's a, a non-notified application and probably meets the rules. So the central city has to compete with all of that. And we also understand that, uh, as Brendan explained to us when he met us last week, that the powers of uh, reco recovery powers are no longer really going to be executed to deal with matters like that. Um, so that's my message. Happy to answer any questions. Yep, um, Yanni, uh, Glenn, and uh, Dion. Yeah, thank you. Um, I'm really glad you mentioned the land use planning. Um, this is our opportunity to talk to government about things that can help the city. So I just really wanted to get a sense, do you think as part of this agreement, we should be being a lot clearer with central government about land use planning issues that are negatively impacting on the central city? Like you've mentioned Maryvale Mall and the other 
expansions that have been enabled to happen. That, that's a hard question to ask because, um, you know, under the current rules, if we're not seeking to deny other people their property rights, but where the central city has to operate within that overall environment. So if they're entitled to do that, primacy of the central city is, an, is, is important. If it's not by the stick, maybe it needs to be uh, aided with a carrot. Seems, I mean, it's kind of hard to understand how we can keep funding in any sustainable way the changing retail patterns in our city while we're allowing huge expansion of, of shopping malls in the suburbs or more growth out in the surrounding districts. I, 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 I'm sort of, I don't quite know what council could fund to ever combat that in any meaningful level other than land use planning. Uh, well, you can make the environment more more competitive um, you know maybe it needs an initiative such as removing the rates differential in the central city that could help yep. right then how do we pay for the big anchor projects well that's you got to <laughs> factor that in you got to negotiate Henry? Thanks, Brendan. The, uh, a question over the financial robustness of the paper for Thursday was brought up before. Have you heard any questions or concerns amongst your members over the, the robustness of the paper? So aside from any quantum in it. The paper, sorry, I wasn't oh, the, the, That we'll be deciding on, on or discussing and deliberating, deciding on on Thursday. I do on that. Yeah, then. I've always been an advocate for a special economic zone potentially within the four AVs after the earthquake and what have stimulated a lot more uh, activity in that space and that would have been something the Crown could have done um, but didn't. Um, just in terms of the, the agreement that we're looking at, um, we've heard one, sub, um, not submitter, um, one deputation say that they think we should stop, go back, try and renegotiate get something better for Christchurch potentially um, or give us more details and stuff like that but from your point of view as a business association do you think the certainty that this is giving and then putting the onus on us to deliver kind of outweighs some of those other arguments or is it, are you guys looking for certainty and delivery or do you think there's more that we can do in this agreement to give more for the businesses? In the certainty city. and delivery are paramount. Um, I guess what I'm talking about here is a fraction of the value of that settlement. Um, I'm not sure that this is really consultation, you know, given that it's a week later mm. and you're about to vote on it and make your decisions. Actually, it actually made me think of the assassination of uh, President Anwar Sadat. I remember watching that. 37 years ago on TV, a general stood up and said, we've caught the assassins, they'll be given a fair trial and then executed. Mm. It feels a wee bit like that, you're going to proceed. Okay. Execute. So you would rather that we delayed the whole thing? No, it's not oh. what I said. Oh, sorry. I'm a thunder for God. No. It was an interesting <laughs> allegory. <laughs> I, was, I, was, I just got stuck on someone. execute. I was like, oh dear. <laughs> Um, but okay, so yeah, no, that's that's good. Thank you. Cheers. Thank you. I mean, I think the other stuff that you're talking about, we can get on and do some of that. You know, there is work that we have to do, and the Central City Action Plan is a good place to start that. I think. Yeah, but it needs it needs proper resourcing. Yeah, I agree, and that's yeah. not necessarily a must. No, I know, but it's a it's an opportunity. Okay, well look, th thank you very much Brendan and thanks for you um, making a submission on behalf of the Central City Business Association, it's much appreciated. We're very aware of the issues in thank the you. Central City and the Appreciate challenges the that people face, so we'll certainly be taking that into account. Thank you. <laughs> right, so that comes to the end of the deputations that we've received. Um, May I make a deputation? I didn't know till this morning that I couldn't put something in the writing, I had to be here. 
Sorry? Does anyone? Yep, no, fine, sit down. We're, we're, I'm in a generous mood today. I'll keep it quick. My name's Rod Cameron. I'm a civil engineer who was involved in the horizontal infrastructure in Christchurch, and I just want to make a very brief deputation to you that we have a huge burden relating to horizontal infrastructure, which in my mind can be renegotiated. It's been described in the media by Dr. Anstis that there is a, a report that says that what was done was adequate. That's not what that report says, and that's not the basis at all of decisions that were made. Water supply, wastewater, stormwater, and roading all have significant negative impacts from the disaster which live with us today. Yes, we did a lot of work in each of those areas, the council and the funders, the other funders, but the scope of work that was done was revisited three times, as described in the value of skirt report and as described on the skirt learning legacy in the scope uh, description. I don't personally have an argument about decisions that were made. People made decisions in the circumstances that they made them. But the residual impact of those things on this community is huge and, in my opinion, must be able to be renegotiated. The water supply is very fragile. Wastewater, just touching these things very, very briefly, the wastewater is also fragile and has um, physical problems. The water supply fragility has health problems. Stormwater inadequacies create flooding problems. And the roading creates emotional problems. And all of these things are a long-term legacy that's going to live with us for far too long, in my opinion, and at a huge cost. And I believe can be renegotiated. That's all I wanted to, to uh, say. Madam Chair, thank you for taking me. I, I just thought I'd highlight the... Um item 12.1 in the actual document that we're, we're going to be debating on Thursday. The Global Settlement Negotiation did investigate the possibility of further contribution by the Crown to the horizontal infrastructure costs. The Crown's position was and is that it has met all the provisions of the 2013 cost sharing agreement and the emergency repair provisions under the guide to the National CDM plan with respect to network reinstatement for all eligible horizontal <coughs> infrastructure. This is effectively the same conclusion reached by the independent assessor in her 2015 review of the horizontal infrastructure costs under the 2013 cost of sharing agreement. The Crown does not wish to relitigate the arrangements previously settled in the 2013 cost sharing agreement and thus no further horizontal infrastructure payment by the Crown will be made. So the Crown have ruled this out. I, I agree with you that it's, um, it is completely and utterly unfair that we have ended up in a situation where the, the negotiator for the council back at the time, uh, who was the, the chief executive essentially, completely misunderstood the, um, the um, implications of the restrictions that were written into the cost sharing agreement in relation to the CDM network um, obligations. So w we were caught between a rock and a hard place because that was basically upheld by the, by the independent assessor. So, I mean, the Crown's ruled it out um, and, and that's the position that we're in. I, I'm talking to Brendan about releasing the actual, I don't think we've ever released the council paper that supported the decision making for the, uh, for the actual cost sharing agreement. I don't actually think it's ever been publicly released. So we, we will release it and I'm hoping that we can release it today. Because I think once people see what was actually signed up to in 2013, they can see the rock and a hard place that exists between the council and the um, in the present situation. I've got Sarah and Aaron. Um, thank you. And just um, link through to that. Could I ask a, answer I just say, that statement, though? I've just got a question for you. Right. Um, which is, 
kind of what I asked Gary more earlier, what leverage do you think that we've got to renegotiate to get the government to spend more money? I mean, I completely agree we need more money from the government on our horizontal infrastructure, um, and it's definitely earthquake legacy. But what leverage do we have um, to get them to do that? I'm sorry, I'm not really qualified to describe that, but to me it's sociological and democratic. So if we as a community make enough fuss, and if we, through democratic process, make enough fuss, we will change things. Okay. And do you think that that is, um, that the, the need to do that outweighs any um, uh, move forward, getting clarity and momentum and certainty that other submitters have put forward um, today? To me, clarity and momentum conflict strongly with the state of the roads which I drive over every day, which create, for not only me, others as well, emotional impact. Cool, thanks. Yep. Um, Aaron? Yeah. Rod, from your knowledge of what you worked on, at the point that that um, cost share agreement was signed in 2013, would both sides have known the total costs and the amount of damage at that point? It's hard for me to say because there was no communication between the authors of that agreement and the people that were carrying out the work and assessing the scope of work. None whatsoever. But were you not still finding more damage and after that particular date? Uh, detail of damage, yes, but the broad scope was understood, the potential scope was understood by SKIRT at that time. And SKIRT wasn't just an entity on itself, it was the three parties. Yeah. So the three parties knew the situation. The cost share agreement was carried out with no reference to SKIRT or the three parties that were actively involved in it. It was an imposition. So Madam, now I'll I, allow you to respond to Thank me. you. Um, I believe there's a major chink in that armour that you described as the government position, which is the independent report is not an independent and is not a report. It is a reverse engineering that says the new scope as defined meets the money. The money is adequate to meet the new scope. But actually, Skirt was instructed to define a new scope to meet the money. No, I, I, I completely understand that. The, so the, the report Crown, is the Crown went back. Well, the minister went back to cabinet and got an agreement from cabinet to uh, reduce the standard around the road ceiling. So not I, only and, roads. No, I, I was going to say, and the and the scope around the um, balance of the horizontal infrastructure. But the road ceiling was specifically um, an issue for us in Christchurch, uh, and unfortunately. Uh, the, the Minister refused to share that information with us. We had to apply under the Official Information Act to get a copy of the Cabinet decision. So yes, we have had a, a rocky road, as it were, a rough ride, as you do now on your roads, um, because you know the, 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 the rules were changed part way through. But I think that what the Council thought they were signing up to in 2013 was quite different to what the wording actually said, which was the restoration of the network. It was the provisions of the CDEM um, rules that were not plain. I mean, I recall sitting there with um, Councillor David East and trawling through the CDEM requirements in order to find out what on earth this document that we knew nothing about in detail actually meant in practice. So we were on the receiving end of decisions that were taken a long time before we arrived. But anyway, you, you have raised an absolutely correct point of view um, in, in relation to the extent of the damage that still needs to be repaired and the fact that successive governments are not prepared to contribute any more to it. So it's uh, not good enough, but it is where we are. Uh, well, my deputation is that it doesn't need to be where we are. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for coming. All right, so um, I'm going to adjourn the meeting until 9.30 on Thursday. However, uh, I'm going to um, defer item five because I think we've got a, a community board council meeting uh, on, on Thursday and they all come in, the chairs all come in and uh, 
make their presentations of their reports. So I'm going to um, uh, just to notify everyone this item on the agenda, uh, the Global Settlement Agreement, item number five, will be dealt with at two o'clock in the afternoon. Um, and on that note, I'll adjourn the meeting until 9.30 on Thursday morning. Thank you.